Recording is on. Okay. That's it? Yep. So we do a little... <laughs> we'll do a little rem reminiscent. Uh, so, do you want me just to introduce this, or, or what do you want to do? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This, uh, so, this is a, uh, a discussion between Hugh and Gary that was inspired by the recent uh, conversation between Michael and Hugh, <clears throat> and. Uh, there were just so many fascinating things that um, came up during that discussion between uh, Mark, Michael and Hugh that um, we thought it was worth uh, making a bit of a follow-up just to, to address some of the, uh, some of the, the topics. You disappeared off the screen, Hugh. Have you got a connection? or? Um, no, I'm on my side. I think I'm recording us side by side. So it's probably just bandwidth. Yeah, I can. I can't. I can only see your uh, your letters. Um, yeah, it's it's just bandwidth. Oh, you're back. You're back. Yeah, I think. I'm, oh, okay, it's just bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, sure. Okay, so w will we just um, go through the uh, uh, the list of things I've written down? Just see what go down a list of uh, interesting points and just deal with them as they come yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing, um, one of the things that you mentioned during the discussion with Michael was uh, the epileptic aura, um, which is a visual disturbance. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, I was interested in this because uh, I had experienced a visual aura, uh, which was uh, quite powerful. And uh, I didn't know it was I didn't know it was related to epilepsy or anything like that. Um, when I first experienced it was when my father died um, nine years ago. <clears throat> it was an extremely stressful time, uh, and uh, one day the this uh, sort of um, kaleidoscopic pattern took over my eyeballs, um, completely obscures your vision, and. Um, it wasn't until much later uh, that I found out that this uh, happens to people who get um, migraine headaches. Um, uh, and then later on again, f finding out that uh, it's also a kind of an epileptic or pre-epileptic uh, symptom. And this was rather exciting because uh, find, uh, getting this connection to epilepsy then brought me back to things that Hugh had said regarding, um, uh, you know, psychotic break and, um, uh, you know, kind of collapse of the uh, alien cortex, so to speak. Um, and so uh, just if, you, if we can just talk about that for a minute, Hugh, is um, – uh, well, maybe just start off with my own little experience was that – experiencing a very stressful time, which probably was bringing on a kind of a breakdown. I mean, at the time my father died, everything fell apart. The, the family just, everybody fell to pieces. And it, it was a curious experience because um, um, uh, literally things fell apart, like like things would, would break and collapse around the head. There was physical degradation that was paralleling this that seemed like uh, literally like a kind of a curse going on uh, that, w that was unfolding. Uh, um, uh, you know, the refrigerator would blow up. There, there was a major problem with the electricity. There was major problems with the plumbing. There was all, things that had never happened before. Um, and um, uh, we were all building into it. So there was some substantial energetic thing going on but uh i'm probably just digressing a bit but the point point is i'm making that this aura came on at a time of great stress um and it returned on subsequent occasions during very stressful times um so uh do you want to just say something there just to, to i've just got quite sure how to how to sort of develop that for a moment if you've got something on your mind there to say about that 
Yeah, so playing T plane, especially about auras and about epilepsy. So um, a grand mal seizure um, or an epileptic fit, uh, as laymen call it, is is really, they don't quite know how to interpret it, but the best interpretation is it's kind of a brain overload. So you kind of think of your brain as electrical circuitry, and in that model, <coughs> you get too much electricity. They're too, there's too much crosstalk. There are too many neurons firing at, at once. So the vast majority of things that are happening in the human brain is suppression, so it's inhibition. The glial cells and things like that, they didn't quite know what the purpose was, but they eventually found that it's suppression. So the major part of the experience that we're having and neurological activity is filtering. And that was a big breakthrough. I don't think people realize that. They think of, you know, activity being <coughs> intelligence. And, you know, we say, oh, he's a dim bulb when we mean he's a bit thick. And, oh, he's a bright spark. And we kind of think of the activity and, you know, being a live wire and that's being smart and that's your intelligence and that's your consciousness. Uh, so if there's not much going on, you assume then, well, somebody's not really conscious. And that's the, that's the layman's model. Actually, it turns out that there's tons and tons of information, far more than you can actually process, maybe hundreds of gig of information coming through your senses and mm. it gets whittled down by filtration to just what's salient and what turns out to be salient what you know the saccades of your eyes moving around and stuff is very very narrow and it's made narrow by a culture and as you get older you start to ignore this kind of oceanic bliss of taking in and learning from the environment it gets whittled down to this narrow little window, which is just what's relevant. And in our culture, somebody that can just focus on, you know, just like, give me the facts, ma'am. I just need the facts. It's just a tiny narrow <laughs> slip of the experiences mm. that's going on in the environment. And then we call that mm. smart because somebody can mm. be focused. They can eliminate the noise and clutter, but it's actually excessively stupid. So the people we call smart in our culture are excessively stupid. They don't have access to this uh, in information flow. And if they start to get too much information, they quickly get flooded. So they spend a lot of their mm. time at Sherlock Holmes, you know, just, well, like a policeman, just give me the facts, ma'am. I'm just interested in the facts. I don't want to know the emotions, the mm. extraneous stuff. I don't want to know the irrelevant details. But here's the thing. It's based on a philosophy that there is no, there is relevant detail and irrelevant detail, kind of Michael Shermer narrow focused view that this is legitimate this narrow sliver and all of this is extraneous illegitimate but the world doesn't work that way the universe every tiny atom plays its part and is legitimate you're just cut off with it from that so you're kind of looking through a straw in a michael Shermer world we are all looking through that straw and navigating really a path which is just a little maze that you could train a rat to navigate and that all works because our culture is kind of static. So our culture is, is narrow focused anyway. And, you know, if you sit down mm. in a business meeting, you're just focused on, let's see, what's the plan? How do we get to the money? And you follow it like a little rat. And if you get to the money, everybody says, oh, Elon Musk is a genius. Elon Musk is a fucking retard. Because he's, you can see just by the way he talks and the way he acts, he's getting about 10 meg of information out of the environment. He's a spur. Right? <clears throat> We also, so, um, hang on, so the Spurs yeah, yeah. thrive in that society. Now, when you get, when you break out of that habit of following little, little uh, maze, rat maze, then uh, you can start to get some of this information, which Michael Sherman would call illegitimate. And it gives you things like apophenia and his connections that, according to Michael Shermer's cultural lens, would be illegitimate. They're not illegitimate. Every part of your brain, everything in your brain, every little grandmother neuron, everything is actually relevant, and it fits together in one big puzzle. Now, it doesn't in Michael Shermer's kind of Steven Pinker kind of way, because they think, you know, there's this compartment and that compartment, but the human brain doesn't admit to compartments. And most people have 
uh, these quasi compartments, these kind of nodules, and uh, the, they they consider them like departments at a university. And they think the psycholo psychology department has nothing to do with the music department, and the mathematics department has nothing to do with the biological department. And it's all horseshit. It isn't nature isn't divided into factors. Mm. So our fact of so when you start to break out of this kind of normy rigmarole. You can get an expansion of mind, and it's kind of like, well, the biology faculty goes and visits the mathematics faculty, and the mathematics faculty goes over to the philosophy faculty, and they all find an amazing thing. If you synthesize all of these, and it happens occasionally, you, they have forums and stuff, and you might go to the Sierra Club, or you, you might uh, go to these the Aspen Institute, or one of these things where they have these forums, and they put musicians together with physicists, and they find... But we're doing the same thing in a new way. And they say, yes, your whole brain is doing the same thing in a different way. And if you could arrange it properly in this kind of arrangement, it would be a kind of a complete picture. So they, they, this kind of uh, philosophy is, is ingrained in something like Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed. And they say, this is the apple of Eden. So the apple is your head. The apple is always an, uh, was generally a metaphor in alchemy and things like that was your head. And the apple of Eden is a way of arranging your head so that it fits. It's kind of like a puzzle. And you can say there's the jigsaw puzzle. The jigsaw puzzle is the universe. And your head can be a microcosm. It can be like a hologram of the universe. But not if you're Michael Shermer, because you've got none of the pieces connect. You've got this piece over here. You've got a little two pieces connected in the corner. But Michael Shermer is, you know, view, let's use him as the dick one, is, is he has these little faculties and little things. And he seems smart because he's got so many jigsaw pieces. They don't fit together. And you can watch him talk. And they says, oh, but these pieces and those pieces. And you can tell he hasn't assembled almost any of his personal jigsaw. Then you get a guy like Sri Ramakrishna, who's like a complete genius, and has completed the whole thing. He's kind of out of the game. He's, he's like finished the game. He says, there's the puzzle. Mm. You can look at it. You know he's finished the puzzle. But it doesn't really help you until you start. You have to do the work on your own puzzle to then complete your own. Because you have to complete it in your own head. You can't borrow Sri Ramakrishna's um, version or Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci can say, this is the entire Apple of Eden. This is my head properly constructed. Here it is in one painting. And you look at it and it says, well, that's great. It's the Mona Lisa. But it doesn't help you because it does. it's his, uh, his hologram of the universe. Now, when you creep slowly towards doing this work, getting rid of obstacle after obstacle, you are expanding, <coughs> opening up, making these connections, rather than look like some of Caesar. Now, if you get under stress and close to death, right, what your brain goes into hyperactivity and what it's trying to do is it's trying to work overtime. It's trying to think its way out of death. So you're building up a lot of electricity, a lot more connections. It's, it's uh, in, almost in a panic mode. In those kind of modes that can be induced in a lot of different ways under stress, for example, Dostoevsky, 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 it is, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Sorry, anyway, what, he, what? He was he was almost executed. He was given a mock execution, and ah, that gave him. That's right, yeah. So the, the a mock ah. execution or something where you put on the edge of death. About the most stress yep. a mammal can take mm. is uh, being on the edge of death, and you. It leads to some of the things that you've said before, like disassociation and stuff. And it, it seems to be a kind of protection mechanism. If you, if you um, a lion, say, jumps out and mauls you, which is kind of standard for animals like us, uh, mm. then uh, you will go into this dissociative state. It's almost in a protective state, but it is in a hyper-wide state. It's in a, uh, a neutral, um, and it's an open state. It's not closed, so you're not shutting down the experience of a line, you're just kind of getting aloof from it and you get a kind of metaphysical transcendence of yeah. this trauma of being eaten by a line. So now Dostoevsky in uh, given a mock execution and uh, would you know facing his own death would actually get this kind of epiphany 
it's kind of a forced or induced uh, peak moment, which is, you know, what something like William James would call a, a peak moment, and it's a religious experience. It's an, and it's, it's not a very good one because of the <coughs> circumstances leading up to it. But <coughs> after that, uh, Dostoevsky had all this information which then poured out in all his works and fascinate Jordan Peterson because, you know, it's the Apple of Eden. You know, he assembled so many pieces out of facing death that all kind of the pieces fall in the face. It all mm -hmm. So, yeah, the people can get to that stage. You see, it doesn't help you to get to that stage because otherwise you kind of like, if you do it on your own or without guidance or by accident, like uh, getting a mock execution, you'll get to that stage without any knowledge of what you're looking at. So it's kind of like being shown the Mona Lisa, again, using that as an analogy. You're shown the Mona <coughs> Lisa, but you, you know, given no history of art, no art critic, no, nothing about it that interprets it. So you can see it's a wonderful picture, but you, you don't know who painted it, what, anything about art critic, um, any about, anything about aesthetics or what you're looking at. So people routinely run into these things like a Kundalini awakening or epilepsy, and yeah. it's a wonderful experience, and they're hyperwiring their brain, but they don't know what they're doing, and so it's uh, it leaves them uh, in a bit of a state. It leaves them culturally in a bit of a state because they outsiders. Uh, they have mm. uh, they have second sight. They have this amazing vision um, and clarity. Uh, of vision uh, that can often lead them to be um, really prophets and, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, um, clairvoyance and things like that. But uh, it leaves them as outsiders and social misfits. So it gives them a whole load of burden. And our society doesn't really have a place for it either. So so it, it makes them uh, some, some outcasts and illegitimate. And so, yeah, so it's, it's usually burdensome, but that, that's, that's in essence what, what these uh, religious practices are building up to that, um, what I'd call a eupsychotic or transcendent experience. But it's, it's analogous to an epileptic thing. Yeah. Anyway, you've got more than you bargained for. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I did, because, um, you know, like when this first happened, um, uh, after a little while, I realized that it was um, not a problem with my eyes, that it was actually being generated in my uh, in my brain because I, I can't remember exactly what I did now, but the way it didn't matter whether your eyes were open or closed or what you did with them that would affect the, the organ of your eyes, this this uh, shimmering aura would persist. And, and, uh, and then I realized, probably related to the extremely stressful situation. Now, there was, you know, as you said earlier, it was kind of like a neurological storm that was going on. Uh, it, it, when it happened on subsequent occasions, I, I was then instantly recognised that, that, yeah, I, w I was just to totally trying to process too much stuff. There was just way too much going on, and, and it would induce this, this aura every time. But uh, all I want to ask you, just related to what you were just saying a little while ago was um, that you were talking about the, the, the tendency to focus down too narrowly and not not experience things in a in, in a more open fashion, but that's very much related to to the linear process of thinking, isn't it? That in order to accommodate linear thinking, cause and effect, following a train of inquiry, you have to. Uh, you do have to narrow down, um, in other words, basically to sort of, uh, how could you put it, to, to accommodate the existence of the alien cortex, you have to narrow down your, your input to some linear simplified process that it can handle, that it can process one, one step after another because you can't have too much too many inputs, it's just going to confuse you, you can't be processed. So I suppose possibly that, could you say that that neurological storm is brought on by the breakdown of the linear thought process, that suddenly it all comes flooding in, completely overwhelms the attempts of that linear process to, 
to to deal with it? Is that would that be a yes. way of so looking at it? The linear processing is in the alien cortex. So the alien cortex is linear sequential. It's it's mm. exactly like a computer going down an instruction pipeline. So it's uh, it is you know syllogisms and stuff in logic. They come from sequential mm. order and sequential process and mathematics. Uh, all these linear arts, like writing and things like that, they, they're all very yeah. linear, sequential, and they're procedural. So you go process, 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 instruction, instruction, instruction. And then uh, it's it's singular and it's, it's um, very linear. Uh, and it has to be there because the, the alien cortex is has very low computing capacity. Um, it's mm. it's really you know it has short term memory of about five, you know five to seven objects. They close. It's closely related to the digits on your. Um, can I just pop in there just for a second? Can, can yeah. I insert something just just in which I think is related? Is that it's uh, the the thing that's going on though with the limited linear processing is the other the other side of that is that it enables a a very precise focus when you need it. It, it it's like maybe your your eyeball has got like central vision that enables you to to read for instance but if you just you just move out very slightly so to the more peripheral it can see lots and lots of stuff but it can't focus anything in detail it can't give you any detail so you kind of you've got a a linear thought process which is really limited but it can focus right down sharply onto a particular thing but then as, as you widen out and let more and more things in, it becomes less and less specific all the time. Uh, so yeah. you, you, you um, and what I wanted to yeah, draw so, in so, there. But, but just on, let me I'll say, to talk so, a bit. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crate, um, uses that analogy of his master and his emissary. Mm. His emissary is what I'd call the alien cortex and it's closely related to the left brain. Most of the functional functionalities in the left brain, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, the speech centers and stuff. Now, the, the conclusion that Ian McGilchrist comes to is that the, the emissary is, in, this is in all animals, even a chicken. Uh, so he assumes that the right brain, the older brain is a broad spectrum a wide aperture kind of lens on the world. It kind of, uh, so it allows, say, a chicken to keep an awareness of predators, a general awareness of predators. And then there's a specialization in the left brain for focus. So now the chicken can peck out little seeds on the ground. It can actually focus and peck out seeds. I would say that, sure, the, the, that is the focusing in a chicken, but when it comes to us, we have a hyperdeveloped alien cortex, and I think you must think of it more in terms of counting. So where the alien cortex, I think, comes from, and sure, it's, it's kind of incubating as a language module and uh, this kind of logical structure, kind of Chomsky's uh, vision of a la language module and a universal grammar. What, what it's doing is it's calculating. So, so uh, calculus comes from the word calculus, so it means chalk or stone. Originally, it's the the word for, for stone, calculi. And so um, it's, it means counting. And really what the alien cortex is, is a bean counter. So when we, we don't really need the alien cortex, we need the alien cortex a little bit in a, say, hunting sense. We don't need it in a gathering sense. So we would use it as, in, in the Gilchrist's way, as a gatherer, because we'd be like a little hen picking uh, picking a grain in the in the dirt, and so we'd say, "Oh, there's a mushroom. Oh, there's a little strawberry. Oh, look, then there's a root and stuff." And so, so it is useful in that way to have that narrow focus. And then it's you know, if you think Darwinian, then it's it's good to have this general awareness. And then that would be from our other instincts, our, our ears and our smell. We could smell a predator approaching. We could hear a, a twig snap. And so we would we we could uh, not be t fixated on, say, the ground too much that we would ignore a predator, say, stalking us. And so, uh, but uh, that's true. I mean, that gives a, a basis in physiology for where it evolved from. But where you, the real thing we need to answer is why did it come to dominate? Why did that narrow focus 
come to dominate us so that you don't need general awareness. In fact, it's, it's a detriment. If you go into a panel discussion or an interview or something and you have a general awareness, people will think you're thick. You'll be like a Chauncey Gardner kind of uh, character out of being there, you know, Peter Sellers. And so people will, you will bring in extraneous things and people will think, well, that's a non sequitur. What's this idiot talking about? We won't invite him on the panel discussion. But then Jordan Peterson is bang, 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 you know, fixate on your star and follow this line. And, and everybody thinks that's smart, but it's excessively dumb. If, if you did that as a hunter-gatherer, you, you would be mauled by a lion in seconds. So something happened mm. to say that now suddenly this is a virtue, this ad pathological behavior. In, in fact, we, we domesticated, we, we, we less functional. We've lost 20%, uh, you know, 20% of our brain in the last 20, brain, in the last 20 yeah. years. We've lost about a cat size of, of brain matter. Mm. And it's all been sacrificed for this alien cortex layer. It demands to what's, what happened in the last 20,000 years. And I think it's obvious. It's playing chess. It's, it's taking the Machiavellian part of the primate brain, and it's using it in particularly what I think, it's using it in a trading place. So what the alien cortex is really for is a, it's a kind of a poker player. It's, it's, you know, kind of imagine two mafia hoods working out a deal. They, they're negotiating, they're, you know, two, I say, potentates working out a treaty. They're trying to get one over the other one. They don't want a fair treaty. Mm. They want to kind of mm. you know, defeat the enemy. And so it's, mm. it's this kind of debate, this kind of, um, it's adversarial and it's, um, and it's kind of close in combat. It, it quickly leads to things like, uh, zero sum games. It's a zero sum game straight up, but it quickly leads into kind of Nash equilibriums and the prisoner's dilemma and this, these things from Schelling. And so uh, I think we have to see it in the context of it's in commerce. So the alien cortex starts to get into a rapid evolutionary cycle uh, because of the marketplace and the marketplace turns into the city. So a market square geometric square is its favorite shape, right? It grows into a city that leads to a hierarchy. In a hierarchy, people are not promoted by merit. They're promoted by this ability to play chess and be strategic and basically be a mafia hood. So it's analogous to who can basically play poker the best in the prison yard. And whoever does that most gets the most resources, the women like it, they basically it's breeding. Fast, very fast. Twenty thousand years of altered us substantially, and so I think yeah. that's where it's coming from—the narrow focus and the broad focus. But it's it's pathological <laughs> now. It's, it's totaled the whole planet, and and mm. Uh, mm. The, the humanity of us, our older brain, is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Now, a Spurg like Elon Musk, who who doesn't have real emotions, he does he doesn't have heart. He, he he's he's a, a dysfunctional sliver of a human being and i think you mm. could put him under brain scan and say half his brain is dormant you know most yeah. most people would be looking at a flower and thinking you know getting all these emotions but i think somebody like elon musk is is probably about as far away from an epileptic fit as a human can be he's almost on an, in an icu uh situation in terms of human psychology and um, but, so you 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 well, you're a dysfunctional person mm. basically a walking zombie is, yeah, is uh, the success uh, in our society. And there's an extremely uh, dangerous and pathological place for a human organism to get to, a mammal to get to. So would you uh, go as far as, as hypothesizing that, that um, autism is kind of like the, the logical end point of, you know, where this is extreme yeah. focus, yes. it's yes. really look, intense, look at, you know. Look, look at Greta. She, she has mm. kind of this narrow vision, uh, very mm. compartmentalized vision, uh, mm. obsessive compulsive disorder just coming out of her ears. Um, mm. the, there's, there's, there's something wrong in the kind of hypersensitivity of the emotions in, in, in other words, you can almost hear the older brain screaming. So when she stands in front of the United Nations and does a little 
uh, overspool, you can hear the older brain screaming. It, it's translated by this manufacturing of consent by the green industry into, um, you know, this is this young girl talking against, uh, talking in favor of environmentalism. I don't interpret it that way. It's, it's our collective older brain and the four lower layers that are screaming under the tyranny of Greta and our culture's alien cortex. And so, and that, that scream for the planet is really a scream for our humanity and our, our broader sense of self, which would come to light in something like an epileptic fit. Uh, because it, it gets integrated in an epileptic fit. So, so we, that, that alien mm -hmm. cortex is disintegrated and it's alien and, and discombobulated. And, and it's in severe distress and it's in stress because of itself. If Greta goes to the United Nations and has a little rant, it's the alien cortex ranting against itself. She, Greta is a pure alien cortex uh, with Asperger's. And, um, you know, diagnosed by the alien cortex itself as an alien cortex, Asperger's. And then, you know, there she is railing in the, again, in the United Nations against our collective alien cortex. So it's um, can I? Yeah, I want to say two things. Um, I was thinking of what you said. I think it was in the, the talk with Michael where, where you talked about the German tourists coming to the Mediterranean for a, you know, a week or a month or however, and they had to capture it all. And, you know, they... they uh, 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 but what I was thinking was a slightly different angle on the focus we were talking about, or you were talking about, is that um, that focusing narrowly, uh, how can I put it? We, we, we become, we want to experience a thing. We, um, We, in a way, kind of want to over-experience an experience. In other words, we, we, there's something going on and we want to... Uh, uh, it's kind of like if you're having sex and you want to enjoy looking at yourself doing this, if you, you want to enjoy the pornographic version of it at the same time that you're actually doing it. In, and in you the mirror. Yeah. Those, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you can't... Um, and so p part of the focus thing is uh, wanting to kind of, I guess, just um, isolate experience and, and um, uh, enhance it. But in the process of doing that, it's rather like a scientist uh, dissecting some thing so he can zoom in on, on a particular cell or part of an organism. But in the process of doing that, he finds what he wants to look at, but he destroys the organism in, in, in the yeah, process it's, it's of like doing it. He kills it, you know. You remember in Mice and Men, Lenny, who, who like loves little animals, but he, he picks them up and grasps them too hard and always kills them. And so kills he them, yes. Canary. It's like, yes. oh, look at this adorable canary, crash, oh, damn. And it's like, oh, yeah. look at this adorable little mice. And so, so we like little kids, like, like halfwits. Yeah. And so we want to grasp mm -hmm. this, this right hand connected to the left brain is graspy. It's 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 good in a primate, you know, to grasp things. Mm. But you know the story about you get a calabash and how the, how they the, 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 the coconut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or a gourd. That was or amazing. Like a small, yeah, yeah. Plastic thing won't let go of the seeds because it has. That was an amazing video. Yeah. But but I know the, when you the, when you posted the, that, I thought, my God. <laughs> but this is this is us entirely. You see, this is what this I'm is saying. us. This is, particular yeah. German frame of mind is you you know you've got to you've got to own the ship you can't visit you've got to own it and that's one of the problems mm. okay simply bashing Germans I'm terribly sorry if you're German and you're watching this but basically it is a national tray that you can't just visit some fucking place you have to own it you have to grasp it you have to control it so people they can't come and visit they can't be tourists or visitors they have to put a stamp or control or ownership. They have to change it. They have to, like, say, oh, you know, all the Greeks, they're here 10 minutes in Greece, and they have this meme in their head. 
the, the Greeks are lazy. And so then, you know, it's complete horseshit. Greeks work 10 times, I mean, I've worked in Germany. Greeks work 10 times harder than Germans. But, but they have this mean. And so then they see that they look at the Greeks and they, they say, you know, oh, look at this. It doesn't work. Everybody's late. And, and see, the guy that, in Greece, they're running on Kairos time. They're actually being very, yeah. very efficient. And uh, the Germans think they're being totally inefficient because they can't keep time with the watch. The Germans are efficient because to time on a watch, to keep the trains running on time, yeah. takes an extraordinary amount of slave labor. It takes a, a, such a, a toll on the environment. It consumes huge amounts of energy. Yeah. And the psychic costs of that are extraordinary. So Germans are hugely profligate. Germany itself is an abomination to environmentalism, although then it's all like, but we green and we do green problems. It's, it's not true at all. It's, be, it's because keeping everything running synchronously is hugely expensive. But, and the Greeks don't do that. They just do it, you know. But there's a lot of tension in it here. The environment, the manana attitude, and just, just do things when they're there. Easy come, easy go, go with the flow is extraordinarily efficient. So, but, but Germans can't. Yeah. And so, so that's, that, that's very important because that, uh, the way you measure uh, the, the activity is the outcome you get. And so, so this is hugely important for environmentalism because you can easily measure you know, efficiency from all these bogus things like miles per gallon and stuff like that. Miles per gallon, if, mm. if I get a huge amount of miles per gallon, a very efficient car, you say, well, this is very efficient. We're saving resources. No. As Derek Jensen points out, you will use that high you efficient car to make one more, more, gallon. more cars. <laughs> You'll be on the Germans yeah. paradox. You basically yeah. will be consuming more resources because you've just mm. made a, it's kind of like a shunt in, a, in electrical terms. Is You need a resistor, yeah. not an open-ended shunt. And so anyway, talking about open-ended shunts, in a lot of ways, that's what we're doing in terms of evolving to this realizational experience and getting the epileptic fit. An epileptic fit in electrical terms is kind of like having shunts. A shunt means, you know, some, some connection with no resistance. So the yeah. Michael Shermer has resistors everywhere. You know, you just talk to him and you can see resistance, 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 resistance. Every, mm -hmm. So he has resistors in, you know, you know what a resistor is in an electrical Yes, component. yes, a circuit, yeah. So the yeah. Flow of, of current. And, and so, and it creates a voltage differential. So what people are doing when they have an epileptic fit is in electrical terms, all the pieces are just, there's not enough resistance. Uh, electricity is just flowing everywhere. And the net result is you have at least part of yourself that like you say, can see itself in the mirror when you're having sex. So it's, it's kind of like having an orgasm. An orgasm is also, you know, this complete lighting up of every fucking it takes it up, yeah. and but you have mm. there is a module that is parting in your alien cortex in fact that <clears throat> stands aloof and can look down on this experience of epilepsy or an epileptic fit or a you psychotic experience or psychotic break and it can look as if you having an orgasm uh, and watching you know watching yourself in the mirror it, it is kind mm. of like that. The, pro the thing is, the net result is after you've done that, if it just happens once, for, uh, there's a Hebbian response, right, in, in neurology. That's the neurons that fire together, wire together. So what happens is if you have one of these experiences, all the possible modules in your brain wire together. And hopefully, if the setup was right, they wire together in this apple of Eden correct form, which is basically the, the jigsaw puzzle laid out as it's supposed to be in its divine form. And so then, you know, if you have that just once, just by heavy and wiring, you will get this kind of wiring mm. of, uh, let's call it the Apple of Eden module, and it mm. leaves this kind of aloof observer. It's, it's, the, it's the prototype of a meta-organism and a meta arrangement in, in your neurology. So the, in, in ancient Egyptian terms, they'd say it was the completion of the pyramid. And that's why you see in the pyramidian, you, you see the pyramidian and the, the eye, um, you know, in the, the, the um, cap, yeah. 
the cornucopia. You're not the cornucopia. The yeah. what's it called? The 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 the, 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 yeah, the, the cap the um. The, 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 it's called the peak, pyramidion, the yes. little the little cap on the yeah, top. A little bit on the, the top. The, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the providence, uh, the providential pyramid, or whatever it's called, is 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 it it came from Freemasonry, and the Freemasons got it from ancient Egypt via Hermes Trismegistus. And and this, that's what it's all about. It's it's about wiring up a new self. Yeah. A, Can I ask something? Self. Yeah. This 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 gets to what I wanted to actually ask you about was that uh, just to to wind back a little bit is, for instance, when I was experiencing the uh, the aura, these auras, and. Um, you can't actually do anything because your eyes don't work properly. I mean, everything you try to look at has got this aura in front of it. So it's futile to try and carry on your normal things. You've got to stop. Um, and uh, and it just keeps building and getting stronger and stronger and all the time. You, um, but what I'm asking you, just relating to what you just said, is in that case, well, what I did was just went and light, went, went, got on the bed and just lay down because, you know, it, it uh, stops you from feeling disoriented and dizzy. But it's sounding to me as though, and of course you would fall asleep and then after a couple of hours you'll wake up and it's probably gone or almost gone. But it's sounding to me as though what a person probably should do in that position is keep it going and keep it building until because it's doing something. And if you if you go and lie down and relieve it, and it, it fades off. You've missed your your uh, you've you've stopped. Something important is going on. You, you, you're actually um, um, just letting it drain away. In, yeah. in a way, does, does, does that sound yes. reasonable? Yes. You know, so, the, okay. you know, like, so so because that's why I was wondering because it would return. I would have that experience again and again and again, and every time I'd go into the same response was, oh, God, this is just so unpleasant. And I'd go and lie down, and then it would go away, and then I would get up and just repeat my usual shit. But it's beginning to look as though the reason why it was repeating was because I wasn't letting it go far enough yeah. to really yeah. do something worthwhile, and therefore it would be, come back and have another go, so to speak. You know, uh, it would, so would say... This yeah, so 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 the thing to do, you're absolutely right. You must try and enhance it, not try and diminish it. But yeah, it's just to, occurred to me. Yeah. To it is to keep keep your spine straight. Now you mm. can keep your spine straight by lying down, on, but it's not good because we habituated normally to go to sleep when we lie down. So it's better to stay upright. And uh, and so keep your spine straight in a meditative position, even if it's just you know in a pharaonic pose in you know right angles on a chair is good. Um, not leaning against the back, otherwise you might go to sleep. But you don't want to get to a vacuous place where you just zone out. It's the opposite. You you zone in, and the, the experience becomes more and more intense. It's mm. very. Tied, what you mentioned a lot is the vigil thing. It was very tied, tied to our civil love for bizarre reasons. The visual part of our brain is in the hind part, hind brain. Uh, so a lot of the processing that goes on with visual things is in the hind brain. Why it comes out as visual, I presume, is because if you're under stress, in, in other words, from a physiological, biological point of view, you're getting close to a death experience. That extreme stress uh, puts, uh, stimulates your, your amygdala. Now, your amygdala is really related. It's kind of like they assume it is a third eye. It, it was an ancient eye that, say, reptiles used for light sensing. For fo it's a photoreceptor. The dead and pineal gland. The pineal gland, and so when when it yeah. when it comes under stress, it, it releases DMT, and the DMT mm. is actually the the uh, neurotransmitter soup that allows these shunts in all the things. So it's basically it it's what allows this hyperconnectivity and allows in in essence the epileptic fit, but it has strong uh, overtones of of lights and patterns. It's very much like an LSD trip. It's very psychedelic. And the reason is because it is uh, all those chemicals, D DMT, 
uh, all the, the chromatic chemicals, um, things like circadian rhythms and all of that, they all uh, related to chromatins and they all related to visual experience. So this is, so, yeah, so this is what it, it, you experience as, as a visual phenomenon, you know. It, well, almost, almost nobody has, um, has auditory uh, hallucinations yeah, with the, the ordinary, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they're all yeah. visual, right? And the, the reason is, mm. uh, the, the is, is that I, I presume the reason is that a lot of it has to do with those those end of life chemicals or extreme uh, traumatic stress chemicals, which are things like noradrenaline and cortisol and DMT, and um, and so. I, I just before I got on this call, funny bit of synchronicity, there, there was this article in, in New Scientist that I just caught a glimpse of that said that dogs can detect when somebody's having an aura. <laughs> it was an amazing synchronicity. <laughs> oh, um, okay. That's fascinating. They, but here's where it's fascinating. I, I just mm. got, I didn't subscribe um, to the thing, so I just got the first paragraph, but I got the gist of it. And what they're saying is they, yeah, yeah. what dogs, dogs are keying into is pheromones for fear. So that I found very interesting um, because you mm, see, the fear yeah. is cultural. In, in times past, I don't believe that, say, if you look at Gallen or Hippocrates or any of uh, these guys that studied um, – epilepsy they didn't fear it in the in the past nobody they thought it was a divine experience and they had a positive connotation mm. the, i mm. presume mm. that they the fear is modern and it's western and it's because we've pathologized epilepsy and so so the scientists have misread what's going on and they're saying that the dogs can smell fear pheromone i doubt it I think I think that dogs can yeah, smell the yeah, DMT and they, they um, can they can smell the 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 those stress hormones. Oh, they stress hormones okay. and they're beneficial. Yeah. You know, for the Western mindset, is you're broken. You've got epilepsy. There's no good can come out of this. You're just not going to be a productive slave. The end of this is uh, it gets worse, and uh, eventually you need some chronic uh, surgery to to fix it. So they the do doctors, you. They transmit their alarm. They transmit their concern. They they uh, they exude negativity, and um, and they transmit it to their patients. So their patients, uh, yeah, the patient buys into that. Yeah, and so so yeah. what they need to do, uh, they let just... like, oh, you're a lucky ass because a lot of people are phasics. So they don't, they can't have imaginary. They kind of that. While I'm mentioning that, I think people that are phasics. People that, that can't, they're more and more, I think, people that are really the alien cortex is becoming isolated. And there are less and less people that are capable of these states of mind and are capable of waking up and uh, getting mm. these full mind ex mm. explosions. Now, uh, the reason I say that is it's alarming how many people these days are phasic. They cannot actually uh, stimulate the. Uh, visual uh, part of the the uh, you know the CMB um, they they've um, I mean the CNS so they, they the central, yeah, nervous, central nervous system, system. Uh, yeah. and, the, and the visual part the occipital uh, lobe I think is what it's called uh, is um, is losing connection to this this part here so so mm. much so that a thought here cannot stimulate um, a fantasy vision, uh, you know, like, uh, like, uh, you know, yeah, that's in these, these are phases. You, you can, you can tell them, you know, wow. imagine this, yeah. you know, imagine like Ronald McDonald on a surfboard and then they can't, they yeah. can't visualize. Yeah. And that, that alarms me. That, that means that, um, you know, it's kind of like a divorce in the household. And yeah, look, you're reminding me of a, uh, there was a random YouTube video I, I, you've just reminded me of, I saw a few weeks ago, and it was on that topic of people who haven't got, uh, you ask them to visualise something and they can't do it. They, they're just, um, 
absolutely. I, I, I think uh, it's dangerous. It's an alarm call. It's it's a it's a mm, it's wow. a ten thousand bell alarm call, and and nobody's mm, hearing it. Mm. Yeah. Um, can I go back a little bit? Um, the what I want to ask you, I don't I don't know what the relevance of this might be, but um, uh, I used to get very bad migraine headaches from like teens onwards uh, and um, uh, I didn't ever get auras associated with uh, migraine headaches but uh, quite a lot of people do apparently um, and it, what happened was um, many years later when I first had encountered really severe depression is that The depression became entrenched. I never ever had migraine headaches again, um, and uh, it, it seemed to me just peculiar that I couldn't um, actually see a mechanism or any sort of connection between depression coming on and migraine headaches disappearing, and then later on again, um, this visual aura, which can be part of the um, migraine headache, which I didn't have, it was appearing over there on the other side of the depression all by itself. You know, <laughs> it needed to be back there where the, where the, where the migraine headache was, and it wasn't. There, there was, uh, you know, like um, migraine, depression, and aura in, in, in the time scale. Uh, does that say anything to you? Is yeah. It, what would so, you say so this, about is, that? this is my, what my guess is that, that's going on. So the the depression, I my guess is 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 related to glucose and oxygen. So if you have uh, low glucose on the brain, it's basically is, it's low on fuel, and yeah. <clears throat> and uh, it, oxygen uh, it can't burn. So the brain is a very expensive organ. It burns about twenty percent of um, uh, <clears throat> calorie budget. Glu so, the glucose, yeah, yeah. So now. Um, now, what happens if you're getting a migraine is, yeah, my interpretation of it is you're, you're, there's a lot of activity in your brain. And you're, uh, basically, this, the system tells itself and tells the heart, I need more blood. There's a lot going on. It's you know, uh, so similar to a muscle. It will, it will demand more oxygen. And so the, the rest of the body will start delivering. Or you'll get... You know all these things like, in um, like uh, adrenaline and stuff that will make it pump. Or you make your, uh, you know, raise your blood pressure, make your 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 heart pump harder to feed the brain with this uh, this fuel that it needs and oxygen. So it's you know, like a car. You know, <laughs> let's just assume yeah. that the car run, is aspirated by oxygen and it runs on a, a fuel of of um, say glucose or uh, you know, that kind of thing so so okay now what happens when you get a migraine is the the blood vessels are dilating because of the extra demand for oxygen which is fed you know through your carburetor system and your carburetor system is your mm. blood vessel. so now where when the blood vessels dilate they they surrounded by nerves and those nerves get pinched between the muscle and the dilating uh, blood vessel. Mm, and so yeah, that's where yeah. the end signal comes from. Basically, the, yeah. screen, the, muscle, the muscle stays semi-rigid because it thinks you're in an alert state. It, it assumes that you know your amygdala is telling it there's something going on. It's probably a lion stalking me or something. So it's, yeah, it, it's yeah. the muscle centers. The muscles stiffen up. But at the yeah, same and then time, the blood vessels blood expanding out. Expanding yeah, and, yeah. And the, mm. the the nerves that run parallel to the blood vessels get pinched, mm. and that's a pain yeah. signal, which makes it all worse. Now, mm. the way through mm. is is pretty much the exercise we do is to you learn to just let those muscles relax. If those muscles deliberately relax, the the, the blood vessels get relief, and they can start pumping more oxygen. If you have more oxygen, yeah. then basically you, you will start to, to uh, elevate that, that state and get the aura. So when you immediately swap that mode into depression, what it means is 
now you're no longer getting the headaches, but you know your blood vessels are not pumping, you're not getting the oxygen, and you're not getting the glucose. So it's it's kind of like the machine has just got into a lower gear, and now it's on a flatter plane. It's not, it's it's not pumping out so much energy. You need a lot. So it's of not energy. demanding as much. Yeah. 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 You, this this is uh, really a young person's game. You need a, a lot of energy energy for this. Um, and, and so you need to be in, in good physical health. You can't really be much of a wreck. And it, it certainly mm. helps you to, you know, to be physically healthy and have a good oxygen supply uh, to your brain. By the, by the way, just on that point. Yeah. Um, should we should move on a little bit. Oh, oh, I must say this because they're, they're, this, this is important. There are yeah. a lot of charlatans yeah. out there that will, will teach you breathing techniques. It's a gimmick. Yeah. They're teaching you hypoxia. And they, they give you a sense mm -hmm. of vertigo. And um, it's, it's really, they, they can make you get into a semi-faint state. So you can yeah. almost faint. Yeah. And it's, it's a con. They, 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 people go, oh, you know, I just did these breathing exercises. And uh, I've even seen people that say, and I passed out. And they consider that a religious experience. It's not. It's just a cheap trick right. to, to Look, deprive you of oxygen, give you hypoxia. And then they tell you that's a religious experience. It's not at all. Those guys are absolute fucking charlatans. They should be shot, a lot of them. Maybe we we'll just take a little diversion into that for a moment and just see where it leads to. Is that, uh, uh, you know, in times gone past when I was exploring various bits of spiritual stuff, I did read about various uh, breath control techniques that you were talking about. And, you know, there's a lot of that in, even in the more traditional literature of, of the yogi things and, uh, you know, the, the, all various kinds of things. And um, I, I didn't find myself very attracted to it. I found that every time I tried to do things like that, it, I just felt bad. It, it just didn't your, sit. Your instincts are good. Your instincts are good. Those yeah, are it just did, yeah. Uh, and I didn't like it at all. Um, and so I never pursued them, um, except for one thing, which I found that one thing was extremely helpful. And it isn't actually a breath control. It's just that you just remain with your breath as you're breathing. You d and the, the, the big wisdom, and in fact, it was, I think I saw it written somewhere, that said that the, the mind follows the breath. Like if you are watching, if, if, you're, if you're with the breath, then the mind just um, doesn't wander off. Um, and I don't actually look at it, look on it, as a breathing technique, but I found after a while that if you do that, your breath becomes ecstatic. It's just orgasmic. That the absolute pleasure of of breathe, you, you feel how incredible breathing is. You, you actually feel the the whole texture of the air coming in and, and, and going out, and then this incredible relaxation as 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 the as the, all the tension goes out of your body at the end of at the end of a um, exhalation, but it it's it was um, um, I just found it was a very powerful way of I guess a meditative process. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 not bad from that that point of view. The problem is twofold. So one, the first problem is mm. that most people, when they attend to their breathing, they start to affect it. And that's, that's kind of productive. Um, the, the, the yeah. other thing is yeah. uh, that you, you really might be just fooling with your oxygen levels. And that's not quite the right approach. Right? So you can, it's very easy to get into a state mm. where you, you do these kind of mock your practices. Look, and they're, they're yeah, I just want to interrupt if I can. Yeah, yeah. Just, just let me make a quick comment is that I, I've questioned this about, because you've mentioned that before about affecting your, your oxygen levels. But, you know, when we do the, the meetings and, and uh, you know, we just, you say, sort of stop and, and, you know, sit straight and put your feet on the floor and this kind of thing. But 
that that um, as soon as I put my attention on the breath, that's already happening for me. In other words, it couldn't be an alteration of oxygen level because I've become accustomed to it and I'll just go straight into that, um, I don't know what you'll call it, just go straight into that sort of meditative state. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just sort of questioning yes. the, the oxygen level so thing, that's, that's all. You know. That's when it's done right. The mm. oxygen level thing is an aberration. But it's it's an mm. aberration. You have to be careful of the breath because it's an aberration that people get into too easily, especially an aspirant that is really keen. And they, they kind of that's a good they, they kind of <laughs> aspirant. Yes, that's yeah. why they call it an aspirant, I guess. Aspirant, but, yeah. Mm. But so yeah, all of this falls under the the thing about prana, and prana was very big in in Hinduism, especially mm. in the early things, you know, yoga, Pat, Pat, uh, Patanjali and all of this kind of thing, the Manu, and that. They, they, they're yeah. big on worship breath as spirit, and that's just kind of what you're saying. Now, mm. the, it's fine, but the good bit is you're just using it as a tool for uh, honing your attention. So you're just basically focusing your attention. Yeah, that's... It's like that's what I'm, what yeah, I think Buddhi, taking the reins of Buddhi. So it's, it's reining in your attention and focusing on the breath because it's an autonomic thing is, is an easy way to do it. But you could easily have done it with a mantra. You could easily have done it staring yeah. at a spot on the wall. There, there's lots of ways to actually get just narrow in and focus your attention. What, I think um, attention is Ian McGilchrist, you know, like, Get the get the alien cortex to grasp itself. Get get it to to yeah. put itself in, in a lock. So it's basically you know tie yourself up, tie the alien cortex up in knots so that the rest of the shit can go on. And um, uh, but, so, but here's the dangerous thing for aspirants that are a bit too keen is they get frustrated that they're not making progress. The other people in the group are going faster than them, and they start to uh, make these substitutes for uh, really the hard work, which is really winding up this Apple of Eden thing. And so they start to uh, seek after these altered states, and they're really just gimmicky altered states that are just, you know, things like fainting from lack of oxygen and stuff. And, th and then once you, there are people out there that have a whole basket of these learned makyo states. And, and so they can fuck with themselves all day, you know, raising yeah, and loving yeah. it. And then, then it gets really dangerous when they start teaching it to other people. And, and so well, the whole the other thing, thing is, is better to, to keep it arm's length. Yeah. Yeah. What I was thinking, what I, what, after a little while, realized that for different people, there are different things work like i know the first time you introduced the idea of the phosphines and um there's i can't use phosphines for any uh, the reason is i know that the i knew they were maybe because there before of you mentioned it. it's so that, it's been yeah. so related all all of this stuff mm. is is so related to the visual part of our brain so that that's why mm. that's why i recommend it so so if, if anybody's watching this and they have phasics and and they can't they or struggle to visualize or fantasize um i would say that they should lend attention to that to try and do what say yeah. you called active imagination but just yeah. look at patterns in fields and look you know in in cryptic fields and things like Jackson Pollock. Yeah, no, no, what I meant was, what I meant was actually the opposite, was, was that that uh, that the phosphines, there's so much going on that it doesn't actually work as any kind of meditative thing. It, 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 it just keeps ah, me in a constant state of... You are resisting, me in, you are resisting, Grasshopper. You are doing a Michael Shermer. You see, Michael Shermer would resist hmm. strongly. Because, because no, the, no, the, the, it's the, the, those lights are overwhelming. No, no, it's that like you you put it for, and maybe I mistook what you were intending, but I took I took it that you meant 
that this was something to focus on as a meditative process, that you focus on these phosphines. And I find that when I focus on them, it was um, a little bit like trying to meditate watching a television screen because there was a lot going on. And it, to me, I wasn't, I wasn't meditating. I was just sort of looking around and, 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 and you know, moving your eyes and, and following all the patterns and things like that. So, and for so me, you, I just said, forget that. I can just focus on my breath and everything's very quiet, you know. So, so, if um, you, so focus in the middle. Ba ba if you focus long enough, you will see something like a lotus. You'll see something like you, an You do, yeah. Guy. You get that. that that's, well, that, what we spoke about a long time ago, remember the painting by um, Kandinsky? Rothko. Oh, no, no, or, like, yeah, or the, yeah, Rothko is what I was thinking of. Yeah. I didn't actually look at the Rothko one. I should have. Sorry, but there's a, a there's a Kandinsky one that has a, a, a beautiful representation of that visual um, circle, with, with even done in in visual purple as well, with, with purple in black, you know, and it sort of grades out, and, and of course it's the central point of the the phosphine. Um, yeah. You see, that's sort of. all. That's all. What you're looking at there is you're looking at the older brain, and the, the most mm. elementary parts of maybe our fish brain. And and the what Kadensky was doing there. You see, he in that picture he had all these alien cortex type of things like musical instruments, you know, violins, mm. <laughs> or those those kind of letters and well, things. Very uh, geometric but, stuff as well. Yeah, it it it, it was, was showing alien of... cortex outside. And then that eye is, is the older brain. The ba basically, you know, like a pineal gland is probably the oldest part of the thing. So if you, if you keep on staring at the middle, you, you would start to see that eye expand. The Rothko pictures are exactly that, but Rothko made them square. The, he, Rothko had, uh, okay. he wasn't very aware of what he was doing. And I don't think he, he, he <coughs> yeah, was. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, but he didn't. Yeah, Rothko, Rothko didn't get very far. But you you can see that he, he was blocked by the alien cortex, and so he did uh, that eye, but he did it in a rectangle, which is clearly shows uh, that yeah. he, he was confused between the alien cortex and mm, the older brain. Mm, uh, but yeah, it it yeah. should be exactly like a mandala or a lotus or something like that. And oh, man. you are still expanding. It's like going into the tunnel. And that's, that's just reminded it's so me of something because, but we'll, we'll come back. But it's so important yeah. because that tunnel is, you know, when all these people have near death experiences and write books and go on lecture tours about the epiphany from a near death experience, they, they often talk about going through this tunnel, you know, the classic tunnel, yeah. going to the light thing. Yeah. And, and so that, that going into the light is that's what it is. And the more you focus on that tunnel, and the more I you understand. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I, all right. No, no. Look, thanks for that. I appreciate that. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't attempting that at all. So that's, that's really great. That, that's, I'd like to explore that. I feel that I feel as though it's got a lot of possibility in it. I can see what you're saying. Yeah, think of it like a um, birth canal. That, that's or the case. I think I, yeah, that's what there's something. I knew there was something miss. Yeah, because uh, you know you were talking about it, and I thought, you know, I should be able to dig this, man. You know, like what's, you know, but you've actually given me the key to it. Now, now I'm getting what. Now I can see a way. Well, well that's yeah, the birth yeah, canal that's, that you're born through, right? So right. The, that's the, the yeah. No, no. Now that you, now that you. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've said that, everything else come yeah uh, informs everything else informs that, and I think I'll get yeah that's going to be yeah, very so interesting see, actually. That's really exciting. You see, you yeah. see the you see what, yeah. if you go and look at the like in in the Gulf of Morbihan or you know the I did a early video I think the second one about Gavrini. Uh, you can see the the Celtic symbols. A lot of those cave paintings, the the thirty two classic. Um, symbols they're doing. They're von Petzinger symbols, symbols, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're doing the, their sigils yeah. up from yeah. from doing what later you can see Zen people doing is, you know, a Zen master will tell you, go sit in front of a wall and just look at a blank wall. Well, you'll soon start seeing all these things. And what they're coming is because on a blank field, your, uh, your visual cortex will start to paint these things in. 
because it's part of yeah. its, its wiring. And so what they yeah. were doing on the cables is you can see what they've done. They've, they've seen the after image that they can see in their eyes from their meditation on a blank wall of a cave. And then they've mm. carved it out. They've, they've subtly, mm. they've, they've got some apophenia. They've got some, they can do some pattern recognition in the natural grain of the rock and stuff. And it, you can see that it, yeah. the grain of the rock is yeah. stimulated and a bit of random. And then yeah. what they've, they've sat there meditating and they've, they thinking of it, they must be thinking of it as a kind of a membrane into another dimension. And so they know that if you yeah. sit in front of the old wall, you will, you will eventually, you'll start to see stuff like a movie screen. And then they say, you know, the visions and uh, dreams and stuff are very, very important to the ancients. So by looking at the yeah. sun field, you can induce the dreams, and then you can induce these visual artifacts. And then, mm. you know, with the tool, you can start carving them out on the wall and enhancing them. Now, there are two reasons to do that. This is a feedback loop. Now you can start to see those artifacts better in your and mm. and two that if you're a shaman, they can be a cue for a, 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 a novitiate or, or 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 a trainee. So you can you can actually have a disciple that then has a kind of Borg mind meld with the master's visual patterns. So it's a way of communicating the visual patterns. By the time you get to India. The guys are doing mandalas and chalk and stuff. So the master will do one of these mandalas, and then it becomes something that, that the student can meditate on. The idea being that the master, it's kind of mystical kind of pseudoscience, really. But the, saying the master perfected his own brain. So if you if he can actually put the, the mandala or the... If you go into the mandala, then that comes back into you. Yeah, then basically you can imprint... Mm. The, the disciple with the master's uh, work uh, mm, on the brain. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a really fascinating. Um, well, yeah, that, that's what amazing. they're doing in a cave. But you tell that to an anthropologist, and they, 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 they think you just fell off your rocket. <laughs> yeah, but again, uh, again, it goes back to uh, uh, something you, you said in the meeting with Michael, which was, uh, um, you know being by yourself and doing something a bit weird and probably the anthropologist needs to go into that cave with nobody else and nothing else and just stop and stay there for a while until freaky things start to happen and completely change their, their point of view most likely. You know, they, they will start to get an intimation of what the, those early people were actually doing. But I don't yeah, think they're allowing they, themselves... They just uh, the, the, the archaeologists, yeah. they're just day labourers, they're just good for digging up dirt. But they have no yeah. insight. They have no uh, really psychology. They they, ha they don't understand the first clue about what the people are doing. Mm. And, and actually, mm. it's so bad that the the field itself um, discourages people to to try and uh, yeah. They really uh, need a uh, what the guys like what what they need is is a. a Kind of uh, what would you call to anthropologist who goes along with them and whose function is purely to imagine possibilities. Do, don't do any digging. Don't do any carbon dating. Do nothing. Well, just sort of wander around and try and and uh, you know yeah, yeah. fantasize, reimagine. Re well, the, you know? yeah. You see that what um, they the reason why they're doing that is because they linear thinking, Vogons and Spurgs and that. They want certainty. Mm. So, so you see, they think if you do that kind of speculation, then it's it's no good for your career and it's no good for advancing the field because nobody can prove. No, that, that that's why I'm saying you want a, you want a, you want somebody with them. It's it's just forget them. No, but, but they won't accept course, what somebody says. You know. If somebody has any insight, yeah. into this, they won't yeah. accept it because they say, well, you can't prove that, and so they're working on this false assumption. That is, if you keep on gathering knowledge, if you if you go into enough caves, if you if you get enough murals and enough cave get paintings, enough eventually yeah. you'll have yeah. all the information, and then you'll know. <laughs> it's like bullshit. Mm. You can collect information yeah. all you like. You you will never. It'll never assemble into meaning until you start doing mm. that work, and they won't start. So they just keep on collecting evidence, and they can't put the evidence together to come to a conclusion. So that's like. They're kind of like idiots in the in, say in a murder mystery, and they were like, you know, 
we just have to carry on getting facts. Who was there at what time? Yeah. What you know? Here's yeah. the bloody axe. Here's the you know pipe, and this is where Mister Mustard was in the library. And when we get all the information, then we'll know who did the murder. And it's like, no, you won't. Because you're not putting no. any of those facts together or making any conclusions, any hypotheses, or any, any just, they just reject them. So they're fools. They, they, yeah, they it's, it's five fools. Yeah, you can see why. Um, yeah, it's, it's such a tragedy, isn't it? Um, all right, Hugh, well, could we move on a little bit to, to some more things that you spoke with Michael about? Um, and I guess uh, the next thing that uh, leapt out for me was uh, hypersensitivity to, to hypersensitivity to music. Um, is the next sort of thing that we might want to talk about. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just wondering how to break into that subject. Um, do you want to say something about that? Just to start it off, and just see if I can get my act together here. Yeah. So. I think the hypersensitivity to, to music is it, if you start wiring up your brain in this Hebbian model and you, you kind of um, really inducing a kind of an epilepsy, the more your brain gets wired <laughs> up, the more pathways and connections it'll have to your older brain. So I think what music is doing is, is the alien cortex's way of playing on the older brain. So, you know, the, the, the way I interpret music is if you have a violin, uh, it, for example, violin music will stimulate some evolved part of our brain, say a baby crying or a, just a human crying, just part of the mm. mammalian brain. Oh, so of course. Will, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so, so it's basically drawing yeah. on emotion. So, when they put the musical score in a movie, it's it's to inform you of what emotions yeah. you should be feeling. So if you you know you get doom, 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 coming yeah, out, yeah. well that that's clearly an evolved part of our brain that's round about the you know reptilian brain, and that 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 doom, doom, doom is is that's the, the sound of a predator approaching, and the fact that it's getting louder means it's no, getting louder. But, but, and you can see them actually. But, but it's also. It's also Hugh. It's the the pounding heartbeat of being in a in a yeah. uh, um, situation like something's appeared and you feel your heart well, beating and boom 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 and it's well, like so, you know. I'll, uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this fascinating little nugget for mm. free. Is how can I approach this? <laughs> okay, I'll just tell the story. Tomorrow. It's it's one of those ones, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had a lot of unusual friends in my life, and what one of them was. This guy was, he was a kind of Casanova. He, he was an English guy, quite good looking, but it, he, a very fascinating character because he was kind of on this messianic trip. And he, he, had, had, he had had sex with more women than anybody I've ever known. Um, and once there, there, was, <laughs> there was this other guy who was also, mm. he was very, very good looking. Um, and they would almost kind of compete. Uh, for how many congress women <laughs> these guys get. But he, he was, the, it's he a, did a count, and he was literally in the 400s. Don Giovanni. Yeah, yeah but he's but you see, Don he was Giovanni. so interesting yeah. because yeah. He, of, of, his, of his approach, it wasn't about the sex. He, he was on a spiritual mission, and, and he, he was a kind of an anarchist and, and uh, libertarian, and he he absolutely messed uh, with women's heads, and and but he was beneficial, right? It wasn't uh, it wasn't cruel. He, he was a really good guy, but but he was on a mission. He was he was like a shaman, doing shamanism through sex to women. Um, anyway, oh, okay. So yeah, I just yeah. introduced the guy to basically what I'm trying to say here is this guy was kind of a spiritual. Say a sex guru, uh, basically a self-appointed sex guru that was extremely went well traveled and went around the world, um, making these conquests of women and liberating them. Basically, doing mm -hmm. um, 
spiritual work for them <laughs> through through this method. Um, yeah, it was romance, right? And so, so okay. Now he told me once. He said, he said basically, there there is a perfect rhythm uh, that will get to the female brain. It basically right in your. So uh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. It, it yeah. Basically, he yeah. goes. He said, I'll play it out for you. It's doom, 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 doom. And he said basically, if you thrust mm. your penis at that rate, that that's mm. like, like mm. a magic. Uh, metronomic thing that has in its mm. universe, and then yeah. guess what? Yeah, it's the fundamental beat of almost every pop song. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah, exactly. It, it is what was the the uh, um, uh, yeah, but there's there's another aspect to that. It's very interesting because I've got people around here who play loud music and uh, drive you nuts because you actually can't hear the music. Don't drive you nuts. You can hear is, that's what, that's what, what the commercial music industry is doing, is driving you nuts. Yeah. In <laughs> fact, if you do go and listen to the music, it's just crap. It's such, such, uh, it's so unimaginative and, and uniform. Yeah, but you and, see, what, what, and, you know, this is how uh, I interpret it. Uh, you, see, you see, all the crap in it, all the, like, hmm. the overlay of these banal lyrics and stuff, it's yeah, candy. Yeah. It's candy for your alien cortex. It's it's kind of keeping your alien cortex just tripping that, over. That's and there, and this is going on underneath. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's doing kind yeah. of what what I do on my daily daily, daily yeah. round is is try and hold the alien cortex and mesmerize it like a snake, and then basically mm. go for the deeper layers. And that's what the music industry is doing. Those five labels, mm. they they have some banal lyrics to just keep your alien cortex hypnotized, and then they're going for the reptilian brain and doom, 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 which your, your reptilian brain interprets as having sex. So what, what the music industry, um, the popular music industry, is is doing a low-grade substitute mm, for sex. That's what, what they're selling. This might be a point... Uh, uh, sorry, this might be a time just to make us uh, uh, go off at a little bit of an angle, is that... Um, uh, because I have a, a, you know, an abiding fascination with classical music, by and large, it doesn't have that, it doesn't have a dominating beat in it. Um, you know, and large, large amounts of it don't have any, any, obviously there's a, a beat, a cadence to the music, but there's no, lots and lots of it does not have any dominant um, boom, boom, any, anything like that at all. Uh, so, there seems to be a fundamental difference there. Why? Uh, oh, the, the difference is range. Right? If you got, if you got, the difference is range, range. In, in classical music. They they will uh, frequency uh, range. You mean? No, just range of emotion. So oh, yeah, of color but I mean, and timber. So it, oh, range of emotions. So, yeah. Oh so, yes. Yeah. So yeah. so what the classical music is doing is is playing on on uh, natural sounds, all these evolved things. A lot of the things that mm -hmm. they would be tickling is, uh, say, birdsong. Uh, birdsong is, is yeah. we've evolved for... Um, yeah, but I was also wanted to go back where... Yeah, but there was also a kind of... Uh, I think also a mathematical thing going on where... Um, yeah. And we did touch on this at one stage back ages ago on Reddit... Uh, I don't think I'd develop. Uh, so the, the, um, the mathematical thing is is very <laughs> profound. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I just I have mm. to say this. The no, go, let's go ahead because it's, it's what I wanted to. Yeah. It's because it's doing math, maths. Uh, uh, it it really is an appeal to the alien cortex, but it's it's an appeal in a fascinating way because you'll see in a lot mm. of the things in in like um, uh, Bach, say Reisterkar, and things like that is. You will see that he's doing mathematics. He's doing the mathematics of symmetry and mathematics of reflection. Mm. A lot of the stuff is based on phi and the Fibonacci sequence and those kind of building mm. things. Now, all of those are deeply embedded in the mathematics of the universe. So, so mm. the reason why Pythagoras and those guys wax so lyrical about maths and music the Pythagoreans were a secret cult. They were unlocking the patterns of the universe, and they were kind of divine patterns that had an inviolate oh, logic. I've got to interrupt. 
Sorry, I've yeah. got to interrupt. So you would say the uh, Aeolian harp would be the intersection between man, uh, hu humanity's music and, and un the, the God's music, the universal music. W would that be a The, the, the mathematics of physics. Yeah, the mathematics of physics. Yeah, so, so in other words, the yeah. Aeolian harp is, is playing, the universe is playing through that. That's nature playing through the harp. Uh, yes. But it's coming out the other side as as something recognizable to humans as the kind of music that yes, they it, would it, try to, to it, Yeah, I mean the the, the that, Orpheus's harp was they, they took the idea yeah. that the music of the spheres was an idea that there was this mathematics and harmony in nature, which we, we kind of get back to occasionally in physics in you know theories like supersymmetry and you know physicists love elegant and beautiful um, mathematical uh, formulas and mathematical descriptions of the universe uh, that are hugely powerful when when you unfold them and and the same with elegant computer programs is they have a, a brevity but a huge power mm. and so the that uh, is 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 reflected <coughs> it's it's all a reflection of the of the fundamentals um, of of the universe, so so the Orpheus harp is is saying is saying like here now you can hear the made audible with your ear the 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 uh, patterns of the universe, the mathematical patterns underlying the universe. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So we're just to pull the music discussion back to the the original bit, which 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 uh, you were talking about the experience of hypersensitivity to music and describing. Uh, somebody being completely e emotionally affected, uh, having a really profound experience listening to this. Um, and, uh, yeah, just in the discussion with Michael, I was making a particular connection to that because it's just really something I've absolutely experienced on, on many occasions. Um, and... Uh, I was thinking of some particular pieces of music which had uh, had that effect. Um, and one thing I noticed was they were uh, the slow movements of concertos or sonatas, um, which um, uh, and that's the because I was nearly going to post those links to those pieces of music under the video with you and Michael talking so that people could look at that. And I realised something th that you said a little while ago. Um, I realised, well, I'll go back a bit, which is when I listen to a piece of classical music and I say it's a, a sonata with three movements and, uh, and one movement is particularly beautiful and there's a tendency to want to just listen to just that movement and not the other two, which might be before and after it or, you know, whatever order it's in. That seems to me to be a bit of an insult to the to the composer, a bit of an insult to the music to just, it's it's like a little kid who eats the, the icing off the top of their cupcake and throws the rest away or something. It doesn't experience the full That's exactly, intention exactly. of the thing. But there, there was a further insight into that, which is... There was a further insight into that, though, that I felt was important because I thought to myself, if I post those particular movements under that video so that people can listen to it, um, that would be a bad mistake because in one particular instance, which is, uh, 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 well, in, in all of them, but anyway, I'll just deal with one, which is Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata, um, which is a very long probably one of the longest piano sonatas in, in time, duration that, that's been written. Um, it has a very active first movement that, that's absolutely not going to grab you emotionally at all. It, it's, it's off, you know. Uh, um, and then I realised it was very important to listen to that first before it gets to the second movement, which is absolutely the most transcendent thing you could imagine, uh, because it was like what, a point that you made about tension and release that that first movement is very active and you're you're um you're uh, you're in a completely different space and then it will just go 
quite become quite peaceful and almost disappear. And you think, what's going on? Is this going to make a comeback? And then it will just go into slide into this magnificent extended slow piece, and which is is uh, incredibly long for for a, a single movement. Um, and it's just, this is where the whole emotional thing will come on. But you realise the important the importance of playing the entire work and not just taking out that that piece um, because it's out of context, because you miss the tension and release, um, and it's kind of like trying to, to distill the active ingredient out of out of marijuana or something like that where, you know, you, you don't yeah. take it that way because it's too 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 concentrated. A little bit like even... Uh, the ayahuasca experiences where, where people have the ayahuasca experience, but they have it um, removed from the, the spiritual context that it's supposed to be taken in. You know, you, 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 you need the full, the full thing. Um, and that even connects back to what you were t we were talking about right at the beginning about the global mind and, and focus and all the rest of it. Because we want to extract the little bit, the, the, that little intense part of it, you know, and get the emotional hit, get the get the reaction to it. Um, so, uh, well, um, you see, I, yeah. So, okay, a couple of things to say. Well, I really like mm. your analogy with food and music. So, the, a, a really good composer would do something like a concerto, say, for example, like Vivaldi and the Four Seasons. The, you have uh, to listen yeah. to all four seasons. You can't say, well, yeah, fuck, I don't yeah. no. <laughs> it's I'm a, just going to have spring. Yeah, yeah. just. <laughs> you, you can only experience, it's basically like a meal. So yeah. you've got to do it soup to nuts. Mm. So if, mm. if you have a master chef and you go and you mm. pick and say, like, you know, I know I've spent 600 bucks on this meal and this is a master but chef. I just want that. I'm just going to pick out the cherries. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Well, what a Philistine. Just you, you, that you, you yeah. not bite into the next meal. And so so you a lot of what the composer is doing is prepping for the, the later mm. stage. So a good chef will put on a soup dish, which may be, you know, taken on its own. You'd say, Well, he's not a very good cook, is he? I can cook better soup than that. Well, he's not cooking mm. the soup the soup. He's cooking the soup as a consomme to prepare you for the hors d'oeuvre. And then the hors d'oeuvre, were basically, basically, a lot of it's contract. So that like Mozart, for example, would, would, would take you to a lower register just <coughs> so he could punch you with... with yeah, so you can go up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so they, what they're doing is they, they're twisting and turning and swinging your, your emotions mm. and taking you on this, this mm. merry dance. When I say you, I mean the the other four brain layers, and so mm. so you you have to go through, uh, you know, all the the entire repertoire of and and uh, whatever the composer said was you know this is my concerto. You have to do the full piece. But, what is know, the? Uh, can I ask you then one thing that always has fascinated me? Uh, uh, and this goes, I mentioned that yet because we talked about it before, but we'll get to that point, um, is um, uh, before the video when we were talking about the people I worked for setting up um, uh, um, festivals and themes in, in ballrooms and that, one, one of the aspects of that was all, always a huge sound system with big speakers and all the rest of it. And, um, uh, of course, it's always paying pop music with a beat and all the rest of it. And one thing that I, I absolutely dearly wanted to do was to bring a piece of classical music with me and play that at the kind of amazing volume that they normally play pop music at because nobody ever does that. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would often... Um, and they wouldn't let me, I mean, I, I did do that sometimes and they wouldn't let me do it. They had such an aversion to classical music, they would not even let me try it even when there was nobody around, like, you know, the, the, the event hadn't started. Why, why is it that, because it's, in a, it's amazing, like there, there is, a, you know, like I can find pieces, I, I 
try and recall, recall it and post it because it's quite interesting. Pieces of classical music which outdo heavy metal will effortlessly, like absolutely trash the whole lot of it. And all you would have to do is put that on, pump up the volume, and it would just absolutely blow your brain. It would put, you know, Van Halen and all those other other people just totally just vanquish them in one thing. But people won't buy it. You can't. You can't sell. Why? Why doesn't? Why? What's going on? It's it's in, the in that, cult that we were talking about. So, uh, okay. so what, yeah. what the what the the reason why the guys are so so averse to it is because mm. it's the same reason why you know J Edgar Hoover was adverse mm. to LSD and stuff is is they strongly averse to altered states of mind. So pop music is permissible because it's you know everybody on a dance floor is just doing a vertical expression of a horizontal desire. As I think, I can't remember who. Said that, but oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically, it's a simulation of sex. So it's a, you know, it's yeah. like we, we have a few drinks and that takes care yeah. of our alien cortex. And now we let let the lizard brain Inhibitions. To play. And so we, we, we yeah. uninhibited, I, you know, get, uh, get a partner on the dance floor and we simulate sex. It's kind of like uh, try before mm. you buy sex. And so mm. if you're playing. Uh, classical music, that that's an entirely different agenda. What what you then yeah, you're in a cult yeah, on the ego yeah. and the alien cortex, mm. and so you you mm. are going to make altered states of mind. If everybody sat there, and and you know, it's a genuinely alarming because they mm. they they're not in control and they don't know where you'll take them. So it, you could, you know. They only there for one reason, and that's basically to just do reptilian brain stuff. But yeah, if yeah. if you you don't have a a boundary or contract with the audience, you might take them all into a dismal state, so that the whole affair would would end up on on a very low note, where everybody's suicidally depressed. Or you could Can, take them uh, any sort of journey, and they they don't want to be led by the Pied Piper. Uh, through their emotions, yeah. they don't have contact with their emotions, other than okay, we'll we'll we, we'll put a little fence around our lizard brain and we'll let it fuck. <laughs> and it's so like okay, yeah. you, know, you have to, mm. you know, the pressure cooker is going to blow unless you have a fuck. So let's make it safe, and we have the safe little reason where we'll play pop music and we'll and then we'll yeah. fuck. And it's over. Yeah. We can close the box again, and we're back in control. But to, to um, how does this, this connect exploration? Is 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 about as is uh, I mean it's only allowed yeah. it's only allowed for the upper crust anyway no, because, see, because yeah. it's, it's yeah. dangerous and subversive for for workers and stuff to start dreaming and yes and start a, it's basically yeah in it, fact th this is quite can do, so if, if if you got a like a a nineteenth century um, weaver you know mill or something like that or factory. And, and mm, you go, yeah, gave those guys yeah. concerts. That's what they did. The anarchists did that. They gave those guys concerts. And oh, all, all I see. It's yeah, yeah, as yeah, subversive yeah. as you can get. It, it, it's it's mm. radically because people are experiencing other states of mind. And they're not states of mind that the elites can control. So it's it's that cop. It's that control. Yeah. So, so but, No, but, you've said some fascinating things. Yeah, where 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 this all goes to? What what the cop is trying to prevent is the alchemical transformation. The alchemical transformation is towards the hieros gamos. The hieros gamos is mm. the marriage of us, mm. uh, the two marriage of opposites, the union, kaniani loni. What do you call it? But anyway, it's the union of of opposites, the conjunction of opposites, and and kind of like the resolution of opposites. That's kind of like the end of the play. Um, and so that they studiously avoiding that and trying to do everything to stop that uh, higher form of love that will is basically love of ourselves expressed in in the universe so the reason why you get hypersensitive to music as you make progress on this is because as your brain is let's as I called it the apple of Eden takes on the configuration <coughs> 
Richter configuration, which is a holographic representation of the greater universe and the cosmos, it, as it becomes a reflection of the cosmos, it gets closer to that perfection. Uh, that's why it's perfection is because it's arranged in the perfect arrangement where everything has its place and each part of the jigsaw puzzle is is fits. Now, a good yeah, composer yeah. can arrange, say, a concerto, say, like Vivaldi's Four <coughs> Seasons. And what he's doing yeah. there, the four quadrants are very important. They're very like the four quadrants, say, in a, in a Buddhist mandala. So if you look mm. at a Buddhist mandala, those four quadrants and those four things of time and the four gospels and the, the, the element of four is very important. And because the universe is, seems to be divided into this kind of uh, quatrain that's that uh, then is reflected in your brain. So it is it, by playing beautiful music, um, Vivaldi was training your brain to take on the form of the universe in toto. And what we all do is we just take a sliver. We just take a part of it. So we don't want the whole. We don't. We as long as we can be a part, we can be a part. So the alien cortex wants to be alien. It wants to be a part. And so it wants to be partial. And so it's yeah. always picking, making boundaries, fencing in, so that it can be a part, because it doesn't want to be a whole. If it becomes a whole, it disappears down a hole. <laughs> and so basically, it doesn't want to go into that hole. It doesn't want to appear in, in, in just be in that yeah, big yeah, black yeah. hole of, of uh, identity with the universe. And that, that disappearing into that hole is the hieroscramos. That's the alchemical wedding. Okay, can I, uh, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, uh, of course, not in all instances, but it, it, a lot of um, tribal uh, music is very percussive. In mm -hmm. other words, it's, it's, it's relying very much on the beat rather than a, uh, you know, rather than a uh, developed line by a, a, a melodic instrument, you know. Um, so what's going on there, considering that, you know, supposedly your, your, your um, traditional societies it's, were more in tune with the universe, but there still seems to be going back to this lizard thing, you know. It, it's true. It's yeah, trance. What, okay. it's trance. Yeah, what yeah. they're doing is, is creating mm. a trance state. So, mm. so, yeah. Um, yeah, so they have to do that beat excessively. So, and yeah, and yeah, yeah, they're mesmerizing themselves. It's, it's hypnotism. So, yeah, so you see, we we need classical music mm. to get back in touch with the nature that we divorced ourselves from. <clears throat> yeah, they don't. They fully immersed mm. in nature. They spend the day, mm. they've just spent the day in the silence, listening to the birds, walking through a forest, hearing water. They don't need that crap. It's like, it, it's like yeah. trying to give them uh, artificial, artificial uh, water substitute. It's, a, it's an artificial substitute sound. So a yeah. classical orchestra yeah. is, a, is a substitute for the nature that we lost. So they're hearing the orchestra of all all day, they're connected to it, they don't need it. They hear the classical, but what they're needing is Eat that to, a, yes, is to um, dissociate it so they can go to the realm of the spirits and the ancestors. And then what yeah. they do that through trance. So by by doing this repetitive thing on and on and on, it's, mm. It's, mm. It's, it's, it's like creating a random field. So it, or, you know, like Jackson Pollock picture or something that there's nothing that you can fixate on. It's just so repetitive that then your mind starts mm. to wander. And, and yeah. Yeah, when your mind wanders, that's the state they're trying to get. They're trying to do a psychic journey. Yeah, so. Okay, so there's one other thing just, just uh, also that you mentioned was this sort of connection between the elites and, and classical music, which is uh, something that fascinated me because I came from a very blue-collar background, like in my family and all the rest of it. And uh, I, I had never heard classical music until I, my first uh, year in high school when a uh, uh, music teacher played uh, a Mozart serenade. 
actually changed my entire life. The guy didn't know the damage that he did. <laughs> Mozart or um, Tillis? <laughs> well, Mozart's an easy way in. You know, I, I, I mean, now I tend to uh, avoid him to a certain extent because he's sort of beaten to death. You know, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it is interesting, though, that, that he wrote a remarkable amount of music that was most people don't hear which is quite different to the more popular pieces and got a remarkably different quality to it, which is quite amazing. But the point I'm trying to make is uh, when I uh, then pursued this kind of music because it was talking to me, I consistently found myself in with people who were wealthy and and highly educated and, and I, I, I was always in amongst people who, who were completely removed from my my social um, position, so to speak. You know, and it was, it was uh, qu quite remarkable to see it was kind of like this real sharp, there was a real enclave, you know, that all of the, the judges and, and the, uh, and, and the, the, you know, I, I don't know, all, all the professors and, and, and all these academic types and, and um, mouldy people wearing tweed jackets and, and all this kind of thing, um, they were all there, you know, and there was nobody else there. There was no young people, that, except maybe for, for some of the, 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 the actual musicians. Um, uh, you know, there was nobody who didn't arrive in an expensive car. Uh, it was ludicrous. Uh, in particular, <laughs> one thing I really enjoyed was this um, regular, uh, there was a thing called the, uh, the Schubert Society here, and it was run by a professor at the Conservatory of Music. And uh, once a month there would be uh, recitals of Schubert's music in this beautiful old church. And sure enough, they would all, all the average age of everybody who, who rolled up would be 75 or 80. They would all obviously be extremely wealthy, um, you know, and, and very cultured and highly educated and well dressed and all the rest of it. And I would arrive on my bicycle. <laughs> and it was like uh, at this, this, um, and I would look around me and I think there's something wrong, you know. Uh, that I'm, this is my place, I know it's my place, but at the same time, I'm completely out of place here. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just making that comment. Part of, you know. part of, it's, part of it's the English-speaking world, right? So, um, here in Greece, uh, I've frequently been to concerts um, and piano recitals and stuff, and uh, sometimes they've been free, and they've been in, in churches or in quite a few in mosques, funny enough, because <laughs> the Muslims are gone. <laughs> the oh, okay, yeah. Beautiful oh, no, kind of venue. Yeah. No, uh, but you get resident... The, 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 uh, yeah, the, the, they're made for the Muslims. Acoustic effects in the place. Yeah, yeah. They, they, or yeah, the, yeah, the Moors were very keen on acoustic resonance. So, so you... Here's mm, the thing. Mm. The guys are, are the hoi polloi. In, in, in the concerts, people don't dress up and the young people, and they go nuts. Uh, so the Italians, oh, too, wow. do it and stuff. So it's um, it's 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 yeah, a, yeah. A, a white Western uh, thing where the elites keep the altered states and it the may be, um, themselves, and they encourage, um, you know, but they, they encourage a cult of, of Philistinism in, in their slaves. Um, and the reason is to I think they differentiate did, yeah. themselves yeah, yeah. And, and to stop them having, having um, anything other than a narrow experience of life. You, you don't want a well-rounded slave. A well-rounded slave is very, very hard to control. So it's, it's very important that you narrow the experience of the slave. And that's what our education yeah. system is designed to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, because you see, I didn't get narrowed down enough, and I found my way into this cult with you. You know, hopeless. <laughs> you see, this is exactly what they try to stop. Yeah, it's, it's like, and this is going to be put up on YouTube. And YouTube, porn, I mean, it's pure porn, but YouTube is not going to identify it as porn. Mm -hmm. Children could listen to this, and can you imagine how fucked they're going to be? 
Sorry, who can you just repeat? You, you dropped right out there just for a second. So that, that was the cop coming in again. So I said, you know, this, yeah, 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 very this likely. It's going to go yeah. up on YouTube. It's basically it's it's pure psychological porn, and like kids could get hold of it next. Mm. You know, you know, and and all the algorithms won't identify it as mm. porn. It's really mm. subvert what we're doing here. Right. Yeah. 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 This goes under their radar. Um, well, apart from I'll just, I'll okay, just maybe, um, maybe it's going to get flagged now. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, yeah. But, but um, okay, but, but, should we end it though? It's like, it's good. I'm only halfway through the list, but we have been going for two hours. Well, well, <laughs> so, well, well, do, do we want to? I really act? like the long format thing. I, I think. I just <laughs> oh wow! With, with, but I just saw the thing with Jordan Peterson. They're saying like. You know the the legacy media is in real trouble because they they all nobody watches them unless they at the DMV or something waiting in the line or they're sitting at an airport waiting to board their plane. But the yeah. legacy media is, is stone dead. They have to entertain. They have to do sound bites, and that format is just is just gruel now. Nobody wants it. And yeah, George yeah. Pearson there was, was celebrating exactly the same thing I've been celebrating. Other people have noticed this too, is that in a long format video, you can explore all these places where the corporate media just can't go to. So this can't go, yeah. That's right. it's, it's, it's basically junk food for the mind. And here we can explore all these things. And that is subversive in its own. But the, the long format allows people to do that. And I, I think people are learning to digest it. I think people are learning to dip in and to skip and to just, you know, uh, you know, talking about the, the concerto, I, mm. I, I don't think you have to watch these videos as a concerto because they're not planned out that way. There, there's no, there's a not. part in construction not. and planning that goes into a concerto that we're not doing That's yet. Right. What we, we're doing mm. is a rambling explore, exploration, and the idea is that the devil finds work for idle hands. So this is kind of like this is more, more like a uh, this is could be more uh, um, likened to a jazz imp improvisation where you just start off and you just sort of go with it, and you you really get into it and dig it, you know, and it just goes yeah. here and goes there, and you you know, yeah. and with, it just with, it's without, got, without, no, without, it's not. Act yeah, with, without, yeah, it's a real. There's, there's nobody to say like you can't go to the subject. <laughs> it's like you can't yeah, stop us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think that's well, also well, an aspect of jazz to, that that it. Do you want to carry on doing this and and make it a really long format, or or do you want to do? A, yeah. A, a, well, let's like, have a look. I'll just give you an idea. Uh, the next topic is your experience moving those chairs. Your your transcendent okay. tale, which we wanted to get, uh, and the next. Just let me have a look. Let's see how that might about be the last thing. Just let me check here for a second, and I'll see how much was stored up here. Uh, the crazy budget, yeah, maybe the crazy yeah. budget, uh, and um, uh. Yeah, we might. You want to keep going because if we just do the two more topics, which is the, 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 the your experience with that, and the uh, the the the, the sp and and the second thing will be the the uh, being weird. You know, having the opportunity to be weird and just just get, try things. So we go to your uh, your experience that you described with Michael, uh, which was where you were um, packing away. Um, you know, chairs after some kind of uh, festival event and got into a kind of amazing flow situation where everybody was really just digging just the movement and, and the whole flow of the thing. And when you were describing that, it reminded me of a, uh, of a job that I had uh, a few, quite a few years ago where we uh, set up these kind of outdoor parties uh, with you know lots of chairs and and lights and sound systems and 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 marquees and and massive amounts of stuff that had to be unloaded and carried and set up and and um, uh, at sometimes this was out in outdoor settings and sometimes it was inside large uh, venues uh, and that kind of thing and when you were describing what you what uh, your experience to Michael, uh, I immediately connected that with uh, 
that work I was doing because we would be doing that. You know, we, we, you would start unloading the trucks and moving the stuff in and getting it up and, and all the rest of it. And after a little while, everybody would just be absolutely flowing with this and, and, and it would be happening automatically. You would arrive and the boss would, would just give some rather general directions. I want that there and want that there and want that there. And he'd just disappear and the whole thing would sort of just happen you know, by, by some automated pro or some, you know, automated, I don't know if it's quite the right word, but it would just happen by itself. Um, and uh, as I said to you earlier, we would often find that we have worked for almost 24 hours and not, uh, you know, achieved a, a fairly superhuman feat of physical uh, exertion without really noticing it because, you know, we would set this all up the actual party that, that we were setting up for would probably only go for it for a little while. Uh, and then we would come straight back in again to take the whole lot back out, you know. And, and so we were fairly well, it was a fairly continuous um, kind of thing. Uh, but you, and yet, even though it was hard work um, and sometimes it was boring, the thing that I was aware of now it was, really did get a real vibe you were really digging it you know and uh related to this was the fellow who owned the business we were working for and he was a, obviously a highly intelligent insightful person and uh uh one thing that that i never understood about him was the fact that he would basically never stop working uh, and I often used to have conversations with him and say, hey, don't you ever allow space in your life? Don't you want to stop? Did, did you need some room for reflection? I mean, why are you obsessive about your working? He was the sort of guy that you could actually be extremely blunt with and he wouldn't get offended. And that helped a lot because you could explore, you know, things with him. And, you know, after I never understood him. I still never understood why he just never wanted to emerge from his work. And then after I listened to you, I realised what the key to it was. He could just go back into that vibe and dig it and dig it and dig it and dig it, and he just was staying there. He, did, he just wasn't coming out from it. Um, so that's my little story. Is there anything in amongst that you, you want to comment on? That, that's, yeah, it's the, that's the lonely long-distance runner. There, there are yeah, maybe that. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, well, you see, certainly in California, you can see a lot of people – uh, exercising four hours a day and stuff in the gym. And yeah. what they're doing is they're hiding from their lives. They're hiding. They, they're running away from death. They're chasing youth. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's workaholism too. It's also epidemic in, in America is workaholism. And the people I've got to interrupt here. The they're, they're very scared. Sorry. Of, they, they know yeah, that yeah. their life is but, shit. And they're, they're no, no, but that's, that's what I thought that guy there. was doing. I yeah. thought that's what that guy was they, doing. They, they're the hiding time. from looking too deeply at themselves. They don't want to look in the mirror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I thought that at the time when I was working with him, and then when you spoke to Michael the other day, I thought, "Am I wrong? Is did I make the wrong estimation? Was he actually just trying to stay in this digging it situation because it was just so good? He, he was just in. He, this was his his. Um, I don't know how to put it. Um, uh like it you know it, it it's a little bit like you know the the risk taking person the 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 racing car driver who who is having a peak experience but only while he's out there but if he could stay out there all the whole fucking time he probably would um not so much to hide but because he just wants that's the thing that takes him to god you know so he wants to stay with yeah, it yeah but it has it's it, all kinds of an addiction right so so you can you can get addicted to those endorphins that you get and mm, you yeah. get addicted to adrenaline. Um, but it's mm. again it's that partial thing. So you know, you <clears throat> see what, what happens is these guys stumble through life, often kind of directionless, and uh, kind of floating through a meaningless life and so, mm. so on the edge of nihilism. Um, they can have an experience like somebody, you know, puts them in a racing car or, or something like that. They, they, they stumble on something that really makes them feel alive for the first time in their life. And mm. then mm. that 
what that is is it's doing exactly on the path down that epileptic fit route. Um, and what it's doing is it's wiring up some brains, Hebbian style, uh, some neurons in the brain, Hebbian style, to say that when these neurons are hyperactive, they are a large channel. When they're easy to stimulate, in other words, and so they're easy yeah. to get a kick out of, right? So then they they get all the nice neurotransmitters and so the endorphins, and they self reinforce. Mm. But pretty pretty soon, it's the same as any dr drug addiction is they can only get to feel alive that very singular and often dangerous way. And so it's it's dysfunctional, but, uh, you know, we're supposed to be, um, you know, hunter-gatherers and we're supposed to be integrated with nature. We're supposed to be a microcosm. And so we're supposed to reflect the diversity of nature. But because mm. we're life, and we, we kept, in, in essence, in a box and desensitized, is that occasionally one of the sheep can w wander off the path and get sensitized. But they become like a rat in a Skinner experiment. And they, they're getting their dopamine from this one... They just keep pressing the, the thing. The yeah. They just keep yeah. on pressing the fucking pedal. Pressing. Mm, and what you're supposed yeah, to be is yeah. the rats in that you know experiment where they got Skinner's rats and put them in this diverse <coughs> uh, you know rat rat utopia wonderland, and so they put the rats yeah. in rat wonderland, which we're supposed to be in, uh, and then then suddenly they don't <laughs> do the addictive pedal pushing they Skinner, do that. and so yeah. so it's aberrant behavior and it's. Part of the deviance, uh, the, the, it's 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 a it's part of our prison culture, and it's part of the the escape from the structural violence and this inhumanity of this uh, transhuman experiment called civilization. Yeah, I'm watching my sister do that at the moment. She's always had a tendency to be like that, but it was just particularly noticeable the other day when I was talking to her, and her only child has left school and just started working. And uh, I thought this was much more than coincidental that she told me that, oh, well, I'm, I'm basically not available now because I've, I've, I'm working full time and, and, you know, we're doing this and we're doing that. And, and I thought you, all you've done is, is filled up, you, you know, you, you, you're not occupied with your child now. You just and you can't cope with that space because something might happen. Um, and the alarm bells have gone off, and so well, we, we've got to get we've got to get full time work now, and we've got to get you know. It was like the the, the basis of the call was um, I had to do some so quite a bit of paperwork for my mother's aged care uh, with the government, and uh, it's a lot of work. But you know, she was sort of wanting to escape from that kind. You could see things she wanted to escape. Oh, you have to do that work because I'm now too busy. You know. Um, I'm, I'm occupied and it's very legitimate and important because it's work, you know, and what you're doing is, uh, is the implication is that what I'm doing is not, not, uh, not, not as important and therefore I get to do the shit job or she gets to do the, the important job and keep filled up. You know, it was an interesting little... Um, it, it's, uh, interesting it's, little I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot. We anesthetise ourselves with the trivia. So there's... Yeah, there's yeah. Yeah. The industries and industries, I mean, the whole, all, all the apps on your cell phone are to anesthetize you with trivia. Candy Crush, everybody's got the, the Candy Crush app. <laughs> and uh, and it, it really goes tough when the guys get successful at it. So, like, you get a guy like Bezos who makes, gets lucky uh, in the early internet, and, you know, it becomes a billionaire. And then everybody's like, well, what, you know, he's a genius. There's, no, he's a cretin, a million like him. He was in the right place at the right time. And he was just anesthetizing himself with a trivia because he has a shitty home relationship and he can't go home. So he stays in the office, um, you know, working away so he doesn't have to reflect or think. And then suddenly it turns into money. And then suddenly he's riding high on this uh, addiction. So basically suddenly his addiction turns into social financial success and then everybody wants to emulate that and then he spins this yarn around it saying that you know oh, i did it because i was excess you know exceptional and it wasn't luck and you know i don't have these flaws that made me into yeah. this functional person i'm i'm uh, yeah. 
I'm a successful person. And you follow these habits, you too can be successful. And it's, it's, it's just lie upon lie upon lie. Our whole mm. culture is based on this lie. That we, you know, it's like, you know the, the mere fact that there are millions and millions of people out there just soaking up this lie that if they emulate one of the, the guys that are successful, they can also be a billionaire. They can like, be like that. No, you can't, because Bezos was a lucky guy who, who basically hit the jackpot once when the roulette table paid out in 2000, as it does occasionally. And then you, mm. you, have, less, mm. you, you have much more chance of being struck by lightning than basically being... Than the, ending up like him. But they, they perpetuate yeah. the thing that it was basically they were in control of it and you can emulate it by mimicking them and so they carry on uh, perpetuating this myth and then everybody works like crazy, um, has a heart attack at 50 and realizes they've lived an empty, half-lived life trying to uh, be Bezos. Where, which, where you have as much chance of working hard to win the lottery. But... Um, they they deliberately inculcate this us from 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 kindergarten up uh, to to basically keep us running on that treadmill so that we're under control. Okay, uh, Hugh, I just realised we didn't uh, we didn't discuss the paraclete um, unless it was lost back near the beginning. Am I lost my mind? No, no, we, we didn't. We, uh, no, we didn't. Would you no, like to visit that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just I was just looking. I realised I skipped that over. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to go into that for for a little while? Sure. Just, sure. Um, what you, what you uh, okay. What I I'll just introduce it was when you were talking to Michael about the um, uh, you brought up the paraclete as you know a, a sensation in the centre of the chest, which was acting as a kind of a guidance as to whether you were, um, I don't know, heading in the right direction, so to speak. Um, and uh, when you were talking about that, I was reminded of uh, an experience I'd had just a couple of days before where I had an unexplained pain in my chest, um, uh, which was, it was quite severe and I couldn't breathe properly. And uh, I... I I think, you know, most people would have actually wanted to go to the hospital and, and get checked out in case they were having a heart failure or something, um, which I didn't want to do. Um, and uh, so it was interesting having had that experience just a couple of days ago and then you suddenly talking about this pain in the chest and I began to, to wonder whether uh, what had happened to me was some kind of a paraclete message um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, what I want to connect with that is um, that actually goes back to the, the the beginning of Michael's conversation with you when, he, when you, you were originally dealing with the Kundalini because another thing that I realized it was that a couple of weeks ago I'd had some therapy for a uh, back problems and that had been very very helpful and I then started to wonder whether getting some therapy to relieve back pain uh, which was a very um, how can I put it it's just a hands-on therapy like it's no, no it's not invasive it's not in fact it is so gentle that I seriously think that it is a kind of energetic therapy but I don't think the people who do this kind of therapy actually even realize that they, they think they're doing particular little clever manoeuvres, and I don't think they are. I think there's a whole energetic thing going on that they don't know about. Um, but it did make me think that perhaps that therapy had let go a little bit of kundalini energy, if, if you want to use that term, and that had then maybe triggered off this uh, little experience that could could have been a paraclete uh um, response, especially seeing that uh, it was in the area of the etheric heart, um, fairly central in the chest. It, you know, for people who want to subscribe to the more to the energy center 
chakra thing, you know, and all, all the rest of that. Um, and so it, it was very interesting. It was extremely helpful that you and Mike talked about that because I started to, to in, in, in retrospect, to piece together my experience using the little clues that you, you two had put around. And I thought, wow, this is, this is incredible. Um, but the, the, the question that was still a little bit open was that you more or less said that the, the, the paraclete is a kind of a messenger. Uh, I think that's what you said at any rate, unless I'm overlaying something that I read since, um, that it's actually trying to tell you something or guide you. Um, and, uh, I was wondering what the message was because I wasn't sure that I got the message uh, or understood the purpose of it. But the only significant thing that was going on at the time that would have perhaps warranted a strong, painful message uh, of guidance like that was the issue of trying to get hold of Roger Hallam that we're all currently involved with at the moment. Um, and I had substantial misgivings about this because I've been thrust into the front row of dealing with Roger, which is is like absolutely my my most alien landscape to to you know he's a he's a sort of so to speak famous person, uh, uh, you know, um, and um, you know if we have this meeting coming up, I'm probably going to have to talk to him first because to, to, uh, he's the uh, you know, he only knows, he's only been introduced to me by the email messages and that kind of thing. And uh, I don't know whether this this sort of message in my chest was trying to, to say something to me about this big event. It, it was a matter of when you get something like that occur, you're then stuck with the problem of interpretation of what to make of it. Is this telling you, oh, look, you've gone to the wrong place, retreat, get out of here? Or is it saying, hey, uh, this is the pain of getting over some blockage. Keep, keep going into it, and and, and you know it, uh, you'll be okay once you get over the hill, kind of thing. So I'll just shut up there. Do, do, do you want to? Have you uh, got anything you, you can say about that? Yeah. So so it is the you're right. It is basically in the more esoteric tradition. I call it the etheric heart or uh, akasha, mm. but. It could be either one of those those two things. It's simple to find out because you just test it. You just, just run the thought through your head in a simulation and see what, what happens. It should light up like a red light if, um, you know, you should feel it run oh, hot. Okay. So you, you just, right. just imagine, yeah. okay, now I'm doing option yeah. A. Think yourself through it and, yeah, and you'll feel the thing go boom. <laughs> and you say, okay, well, it's... It's a, it, it will probably be no. It's probably saying no. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, mm. so then you can you can explore and do so. You know, run other simulations until it, it's dead still. When it's dead still, then you know that's what what you're supposed to do. So what it, it's really what it's really about is really quite simple. Is it, as you become more attentive and uh, raise your awareness, you start to become more sensitive and even hypersensitive. So, so really it is just kind of adrenaline. In, it's probably your adrenal glands is, is the mystery mm -hmm. to what the paraclete is. And you see, when you, you become uh, very sensitive, then the signal from, you know, normally people are half asleep. So, you know, they get rushes of adrenaline and they barely notice it. And so, so, but when you're yeah. hypersensitive, you don't get so much adrenaline, and you, and so then it becomes more noticeable when you do, and then it it's, it, it starts to feel more dramatic. Um, but what it really is is it's just your your older brain, the the older four layers, what Jung would call your subconscious, subconscious talking. So anything that say Jung would interpret from a dream, say. Uh, say an archetype like uh, the old lady rushing up. Uh, Jung talked about an old lady. Uh, he had a dream. He was in a carriage. And an old lady comes rushing up and tries to get his attention running alongside the the, the carriage. And, and his interpretation was that that's the subconscious. The old lady is kind of like Carly-like, but that Carly is, is your subconscious telling you something that you're yeah. ignoring. 
And so it's running yeah. alongside the carriage, trying to get your attention. Yeah. So all that yeah. happens is that those brain layers then become visible just during your waking state in the normal day because you're so attuned. So if that subconscious layer is screaming its head off, uh, you it, it will fire up your amygdala because uh, and your your adrenal gland because it's you know they they hyper attuned. So that's more or less what I think is a Western ph physiological interpretation of of, of what's going on. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, so in a way, um, uh, you know what some people call their higher guidance is is actually a their inner guidance really because uh, i think they often visualize it as coming from uh above them somehow you know the universe but, in but fact, the above them thing uh, is, is all evil the above them thing is all evil so the above them, mm. so what they've what they've been trained to do is is this thing where like do what jesus would have done so they hold yeah, this yeah. model in the alien cortex and when they say, well, I have the higher guide, what they're talking about is they, they're pretending it's God. It's not. It's just the alien cortex, and it's been trained. They, they've been trained with a model of how to be a goody two-shoes. And then your alien cortex says, this is not doing what my model of Jesus said. Well, fuck Jesus, yeah. and you, you haven't got a clue what Jesus would have done because you, you, mm. you, you're, so, you, you're a psychological cretin, most people. So they, they, they cannot interpret what Jesus would have done. They're just interpreting what the high school or the, the Sunday school teacher told them was the right thing to do as a debt slave. So they're using this mm. model of a good debt slave and then saying, that's my higher guidance. And higher like, guidance, yeah. It's completely bullshit. Yeah. Just punch people like so that. So you re really, uh, in, in thinking of, of these kind of metaphysical things, then it's becomes quite important not to use hierarchical language to just leave that to, to yeah to because not, you, you to get not into use, this ethical analysis use. yeah you, you you get you go round and round in circles in this ethical mm. analysis and you become this pharisee mm. and you you start these rabbinical dialogues on what's right mm. and what's wrong and it's absolute mm. twaddle it's complete well, there is no right and wrong mm. it's basically it's it's an invention of the alien cortex that's just a complete abomination. So just reject it. Reject ethics. It's just eth ethics is just your your alien cortex trying to keep control, and don't let it. Just say like fuck your ethics. We don't do ethics here. That's just alien cortex control narrative. So fuck your hierarchy. Fuck your ethics. Fuck your guiding star. It's like basically it's mm. all about control, and we're trying to get rid of that tyranny inside us. So fuck your tyranny, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, all right, that's that's great. Um, uh, look, I just want to make a quick aside here for a moment, uh, just just to run this past you while we're here. Is uh, um, I had a, a thought the other day uh, that I don't know if you would like to try an experiment one day during our one of our meetings. Um, is to try and conduct the meeting where nobody is allowed to use the word I or me or mine during the meeting to see if we can um, keep ourselves away from... Uh, um, sorry, I don't know how to explain it. Could, could you t do you see any value in that as an exercise to see yeah, if people can express that, themselves? Yeah. We, we, it was a we could do it as a kind of... To, to do that 24 by 7. So so for years, Wait, where is this? Sorry. I never used the pronoun I. And I, I can, I can yeah. I, I'm still very conscious of it. When I write stuff, I'm very conscious of, of uh, using from, it. from yeah. those years of doing that. If, if, I, you, uh, if you I say are, the I and me, I, 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 I'm, I'm you, you know very it. hypersensitive. So yeah, so it's, it's, if I start, if I start an email, and I say, I think, but <laughs> I need I to think, don't yeah, change it. Yeah, that's it. And, and mm, uh, Microsoft mm, Word mm. gives me the shits because it, it says... Because you it know, wants to put that back in. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, because it, it says yeah. that it's the passive voice. And I'm saying, like, mm. fuck you and Bill Gates and your fucking linguists. It's basically, I'm trying mm. to get the passive voice. I'm trying to get yeah. the ego out of it. I'm trying, and, and, and it flags it. 
if you, you know, basically the paper clip will tell you that, you think, that oh, you're using the passive voice yeah. and that's not correct. And they're saying, and the, what we say, well, where did that shit come from? It came um, from a culture yeah, because you, you... On control. Again, we're back to this control narrative and this tyranny narrative. It says, no, you must speak as I, me, and you must tell the truth and you must be ethical and you must be a good slave. So even down to Microsoft Word, the fucking paperclip is reinforcing this tyranny. Mm, mm, yeah. And it's a very yeah. good example. Um, no, you, I you we should do it. We should, we, and also take it away. Try, try, just try during the week to to, yes, to not yes. use the word and and try and be not very use, not, as well. But, but this but is it. And you, to do to other people is challenge other people. I love doing that. Is is saying like, you know it. It never gets raised. We have this this automatic assumption that we discrete individuals. It's just our alien cortex lying. But we have this automatic assumption that's built into our culture that, that we know who we are. So then people can make some absurd statements like, well, I think we have free will. So who has free will? Which part of you has free will? It's like, is that is that finger part of me? Yeah. Yeah, it's well, this uh, it's sort of. Free will? It, but it's, it's a, like, well, is is it standing up like that because it wanted it to? And now, oh, 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 did it do that because I wanted it to, or did it do it because it just wanted to? It's like, who is this I person that's supposed to have free will? It's complete horseshit. And you can you can see yeah. and these guys talking for half an hour on do I have free will? And it's like, who the fuck is I? The I is a lie. Look, this came up um, uh, with, um, well, yeah, of course. I'll, I'll do it this way. Uh, Sophie uh, put up, I think she put up a, a post about a, a book, uh, a story, must have been a long short story or something by uh, uh, George Sacralides. Um, and uh, the, I haven't finished the story yet. Uh, but the story starts off with the people in this this uh, sort of uh, post-apocalyptic world or, or something like that. Uh, they have uh, become so pissed off with the way language is misused yeah. um, and, and manipulative that they've decided to abandon language. And that's the first part of the story. And, and it describes what what effects it has on these people once they've abandoned language. When I read that part of the story... Um, it, it it inspired me to write uh, a, a little thing about how language tricks us in into creating the an I, and but that I doesn't exist. But we then go and believe in it and uh, attribute to it what you were just saying that you know this I which is not there. Uh, we we say that it has free will and 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 blah 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 and, and and we're attributing all this stuff to something that isn't there and then going off and abs ac actually taking this as a as a concrete reality. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention Sophie's story. And since we were talking about, um, um, but, it could but be worthwhile. Sure. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. so that is very, very important stuff. This is what George Orwell and stuff came in about, about the importance of language. So new speak was something where you couldn't sin. In other words, you couldn't basically not be a good Because there was no word. Not a language to. And so our culture reinforces that. And, and what we do by teaching kids grammar is try and enforce these cultural norms. So getting back to Microsoft Word, you can write, especially if you're writing quite elevated and insightful philosophy. You can write and make statements that are absolutely grammatically correct. The Microsoft Word grammar checker will say they're incorrect and they, they will say that they don't yeah. have a subject and that yeah. it's, complete, it's complete crap. In fact, the closer mm. you get to the universal truth in, in your writing, the more the Microsoft Word grammar checker will say that we'll, we'll you radical mistakes, even when you're not. It has a very limited view of grammar, and that grammar infuse a subject-object relation, and that subject is this universal I, this individual that we invented in the West. And so, so that's built into our language so that in order to think differently, 
people have to speak differently. You, so you, they have to change their speech. So, so the program of prescribed speech that is happening now with wokeism is, is doing exactly the same thing, but the, the opposite. It's entrenching ID politics, and it's entrenching this ego and identity and saying so that people declare, these are my pronouns before they start speaking. And then they expect you to conform with their identity and basically prescribe your speech so that it conforms with their ego identity. That's as far away from what I'm saying as you can get. That's as far in yeah. the wrong direction as you can possibly go. But what you're supposed mm. to do is the other direction, George Sokolita's way of saying like, okay, yeah. George, George's way of like prohibition of speech is the ultimate suppression of the alien cortex, and that's what we need to do. Mm. So, so mm. the yeah. alien yeah. cortex is the ce celebration of the ego and the alien cortex's uh, identity. Uh, Mauna or not speaking is the absolute suppression of the alien cortex. And that's why, you know, in the monastic tradition, they would have vows of silence. It's to shut the alien cortex up. But Check, even, yeah. even if you look yeah. with the Gregorians, they invented the sign language and that'd be, you know, king and <laughs> God in heaven. <laughs> and they started speaking mm -hmm. with their hands, which completely defeated the point. It just meant instead of the alien cortex was still up there, still running, still center stage, just speaking with hands and stuff. Yes. And it was a complete perversion of the thing. Which that, uh, yeah, that's the trouble. I just, I just got around it. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, look, that, that's inspirational here. Uh, as a result of that, I may dig out that little bit of writing and, uh, and I'll put it under Sophie's post. Um, uh, I, I, the reason why I didn't actually post it was because I, I thought I should read to the end of George's story before I did it, but it looks as though it's worthwhile as a standalone thing, a standalone comment to make. Um, so I'll just put that up and see what kind of yeah, comments it, anyway. That it just worth, to speak worth doing. is to lie. Um, to speak is to lie. And the, the mere fact is speech is partial. So so it's it, it the, the idea that, you know, Jordan Peterson is in the pursuit of truth and right statements and pure speech. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's a complete fool's errand because the reason why you cannot have that is because of what we said before about Gödel's theorem is you can use the language, you can use the, the dictates of logic and grammar to show the limitations of logic and grammar. So, so logic mm. is curtailed mm. by the Gödel theorem. And so it has to be inconsistent mm. or, in, or complete. And there's Jordan Peterson yeah, dividing his life to a complete and consistent worldview. And you say, no, as soon as you speak, it's incomplete and inconsistent. Only if you Think, shut yeah, the fuck yeah. up, Jordan, can you actually get some real wisdom. And there he's on this path, thinking, no, the alien cortex is going to get the truth and it's going to be permitted into no. paradise. And you say, no, paradise starts when the alien cortex shuts the fuck up. Well, See, this loops right back to the beginning of our conversation with, with the with the kind of global comprehension, you know, because essentially shutting up give, opens up your possibility to to take everything in instead of remaining narrow and limited to just what your language is dealing with. Well, well, the thing is that it's you know, um, what it says in the Bible is uh, "Be still and know that I am God." Now that 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 was the worst. Yeah, ever told. it's one. It's one of the greatest <laughs> greatest lies in the history of the world. It says, "Be still and know that I am God." So it's saying, you know, the alien cortex is is there is the lie. That is Satan speaking. That's our alien cortex, and our alien cortex says, "If if you just be quiet, then you'll know that the alien cortex yeah. is God." It's it's true in one sense, in like the Christian liar sense. It's, it's basically, it says the alien cortex is God, but it's it's trying to pretend that it is the supreme God. And it, what it's saying is, if you be still, if you let the alien cortex shut up, you'll see that the universe, the cosmos and nature, that's God. <coughs> so that's interesting. World um, is God. And it's saying, no, I am God. If, if you it, let your alien cortex be quiet, and then you'll know the alien cortex is the supreme thing. And you say, no. Anybody that's really quiet knows that the alien cortex is a usurper. It's Ian McGilchrist's 
emissary that has taken over mastery of the house. And so you say, if the, ma the, the, the master is put back in its place as servant, then it becomes a servant to the universe, and the universe is ruled. The universe is female, it's, it's Kali, it's nature, and it rules. It's obvious. But the physical, the prima mater, the mater is mother. Is the mother rules. Is, mm -hmm. the universe is, is, is supreme. And, and so the alien cortex, as soon as it shuts up, it knows that. You can just hear the wind and listen See, to the birds and listen to the sea. You know it's bigger than you. The, the, but this is it. This it depends how you read that. Um, uh, because uh, I was uh, a few years ago past a, a, a beautiful old church that's not far from here, a lovely sandstone thing with beautiful steep gables and slate roof and everything. And outside of the church was the the uh, notice board, church notice board, and one day uh, I happened to be sailing past, and that was exactly what was written on the board. The, the quote, you know, be still and know that I'm God. And, you know, I just looked at it and I thought, yeah, th they, they're they completely misinterpreting what that means. You know, they're meaning um, you don't have to read it that way. It, it's like the I is... It's the I, the I, I, the, the, the I am, the I am that. It's not, not, um, it's not even God being, per see, they're personalizing God too. They're projecting onto God, um, I ness. Okay, it, but, but it, you see, it, the, 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 the devil is in the details. So if you go and look at that church, if you go and look at the surveillance footage and say, okay, if you've never heard of God and you came across that notice, then you would say, yeah. where did this come from? And then you'd say, you know, say you were really naive, take a naive aspect, say you're an alien, you Ford prefect, you arrived on this planet today, and you say, be still and know who I'm God, you assume you know how to speak English, you say, well, I'm going to see who this I person, because here is somebody mm. who said, I am God, they wrote it, and then you look at the surveillance footage, there's some guy in this black and white robe. Like straight away, you know that's it's the alien. Putting it up, yeah. What did he yeah, do? He yeah. put his right hand. He grasped letters, which were symbols, substitutions. Put them up and there. put them up. Yeah. And he, wrote, he put an I. He put a space symbol. He put an A. He put an M. He put a space G O D. What was it? His right fucking hand. What was it controlled by? His left <coughs> fucking brain. His left brain is lying there. It is lying in a line with symbols. There he is, caught on the surveillance camera, some priest claiming that he's fucking God. So it's, a, it's like, you, he's yeah, a liar. I, he should be prosecuted. Uh, and open yes, I, I know. I think, oh, yes, yes, Hugh. Um, I think I won't go on for too long on this thing because we're probably going to get too, too distracted if we go down this pathway. But I, I didn't have a... I could see what was written there and I understand what you're saying. But for me, the essence of it was that if you're just still, and usually the thing that, that is buzzing around is the alien cortex, then you, 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 you just, you do know God if you want to use, that, that, just leave the eye out of it. If you just shut up, then, then you can register every, everything else. You, you're having that, that expanded, um, uh, global the experience. The, the the problem yeah, is, is that I is 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 give it out because this is this goes back to the language. Like this goes back to no the I. language trap. If you be if still, you somebody's yeah. got to be still. There's a subject. No, but it's just you a see, linguistic trap. If you're really trap. still, there is no I. Yeah. If you if if you're that's, really that's right. still, the I. But when you write it, when you you fast asleep. But, yeah. When you put it into words, the eye appears because the language is tricking you into taking on this the eye alien that isn't cortex there. is tricking you. It's taking it, that it, it, state and sub and sub well the alien cortex is language. To trick you. It's a trap. Mm, mm, so it's yeah. it's it's where it's, uh, webbing, it's weaving a web to trap you in ignorance. <laughs> and that's that's what the language is for. Language is invented to, to mm. lie. Language is invented to lie and deceive. That's why politicians use it. <laughs> it's their favorite tool. Yeah, and the, 
circles back to the beginning of uh, George's story, of course. The listen there. Uh, so yes, just to go back here for a moment. It, it, uh, so maybe for one of the meetings we can propose, uh, I kind of thought of making it as a kind of a game where nobody was allowed to use the word I, and if they did, they had to stop talking immediately and uh, the next uh, person no, could no, then I, talk. I, I, no, what I, or what how, I, how would you... I, 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 would, I would say that you should do your gong. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. Basically, uh, because you, we can... You get a ding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, it reminds me of uh, some of those uh, uh, British radio comedies from probably the, the you know, 1950s, 1940s, where they did actually have, uh, uh, like, uh, comedy, a panel of people, and it was supposed to be a comedy. You, you had, uh, I think one of them was called Just a Minute, um, uh, where you had a minute to explain. There was another one where if you made a certain linguistic, uh, used a certain word, or that you would get gonged out straight away. <laughs> you know, and it was absolutely hilarious, but there's a, a lesson in it. You know, we could take that pattern well, and transfer well, it over there's this wonderful, to what we're doing. This wonderful thing. Uh, and it would be amazing because... Wait, have, have you, uh, have you seen yeah. the Mitchell and Webb thing about the royal we? So they, they, it's about I, Caesar. No, I haven't. Okay. So, so it's, it's Caesar and Caesar, I think Caesar's just like been newly mm. appointed. And then Mitchell says, mm. uh, says to Caesar, you know, like, oh no, he says like, I, I think I'll go, you know, kind of review the troops. And he says, oh, no, no, um, you're Caesar. You, you don't say I, you say we. <laughs> And then, so then they get into this, the royal we trying to get Caesar, and it just goes completely to shit. <laughs> They're trying, trying not to say the word I. And it's absolutely brilliant because it is exactly this exercise. It's, it, it is so hard not well, to say but, I. But we were going down this pathway ourselves just recently in concocting these emails to Roger Hallam, where, where I suggested to you that we should use the word we. Uh, so that it uh, would come across that, you know, there was more than just one isolated nutter trying to um, engage with Roger Hallam, that there was actually a bunch of it. Bunch we of really nutters. meant business, you know. So it, it, throughout, the, yeah, a bunch of nutters. So during the emo, I had to consistently use we, we, and you became quite aware of how, um, you know, you had to make an effort to, to reconstruct the way you were expressing it around this, this word. Uh, uh, the, yeah, what I wanted to just say finally on this topic was uh, the thing that a really good lesson uh, in, in, the, in this I was back quite a long time ago when, when um, Lady Ella was associating with us. And I think in one of the last messages that she posted she was pretty worked up and she was she was deciding to have a shot at you you know challenge you and her message went on and on and on and your reply at the bottom was are you aware that you just used the word i 17 times in this uh thing like that and basically that what you said just in that remark completely um it said it all you know uh, encompassed the whole thing that she'd gone off and I, I this and I this and you know uh, I think the vegan thing and I think this and I think this and I, and I think this and of course you you had just sort of um, basically your message was you know listen here you're 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 you're, a, you're, you're just an alien cortex crapping on here um, yeah what I must say and about it was a very is, important you what I must, I must say about that is that that. Her, her problem is, and the reason why I had to like jettison her, is is because she couldn't see that, right? She she couldn't see what was mm. wrong with the eye thing, so she 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 was so that, it. in her ego that that I didn't think I could ever get through to her of why ego is bad, and so she she just it was too entrenched in that ego. So that is like a, a super demon. So this, this, mm. the, the eye is a kind of a little gremlin, and it's 
you know, kind of known in the Ask Go Goetia is, is it's named as one of the satanic uh, demons. And so it, you, you, you have to, to, to extricate and exercise that demon, you at least have to have the patient to know that they have a disease. But if they don't, if they won't accept they've got a disease, you can't do anything. So if, if they are, have this demon called I, and then you, you can never say, uh, you know, we're all about getting rid of the alien cortex. We're all about getting rid of the ego. You have this I demon. <coughs> Most people are, are awake enough that they can say, oh, I get it. I get it. You know, it's partial. It's... Uh, it's limiting, it's, it's holding you back, it's an obstruction from seeing that you're Godhead in the universe. Most people can make, make that intuition. But for some people, they, they are so consumed by this demon that you can't even tell them that they have a demon in them. Otherwise, I don't have a demon. Oh, it's like, no, that one. Yeah. That's yeah. the one. And then, like, yeah. this demon has taken them over body and soul. So that the demon talks for them. They, 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 they uh, the demon, it's kind of like uh, they held so hostage by this demon that the demon yeah. won't even know how to speak. And when you say, you've been held hostage by a demon, says, I'm not. I say, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the victim that you've got there on a chair wrapped up in rope. And so you, some cases are just too hard. That this is the thing. Um, that ego. This was the tragedy in that little incident because um, she obviously got very upset, and uh, um, yeah, because she just didn't understand your point, and and of course, obviously, caused her a lot of needless suffering. But there was really nothing much could be done about it. You know, um, it's rather unfortunate. But you see, there's no way um, you can go if you let that demon in the room. It, all, all it's going to do is dominate and try try to yeah. get all the attention, suck the energy. It's a vampire. It'll it'll suck the energy out of the room. It's Nobody just, will be able to make progress. It's just poison. And that, that's yeah. That that was what I felt when uh, when I was communicating with her. That um, uh, it was just going to go on and on and on because all the communication wanted was just to perpetuate itself and just keep drawing on you the whole this time. narcissism yeah you it's know. basically it, it's it's mm. the more attention it gets the more you feed the narcissism so it gets its narcissistic yeah. supply anyway good feedback bad feedback it doesn't matter as long as it's, it's still still getting it either way yeah. yeah um here can we move on perhaps to the and make it the final thing probably by the looks of it is the uh, the space to the, the, what you were talking about with Michael was the space to be weird, the crazy budget, uh, the divine madness, um, and uh, like if you're going to go up a tree and, and live like a monkey, you know, in the society we live in, you've got to be careful how you approach. Um, uh, you've going, got to be pretend you're bit... Jane Goodall and you're doing a study or something like that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, I guess one comment I wanted to make um, um, was I related a story to you before this interview about a crazy thing I did when I was young. Um, and I was able to do it because I had a, a physical space where no, I knew nobody would disturb me. And um, uh, one thing I noticed nowadays is that we have such a filled in and heavily observed existences that people, very few people have got uh, a worthwhile amount of private space where, where they can even be weird all by themselves, let alone be weird in public. But, you know, they don't have a sufficient, um, they don't have a, um, a, a little environment in which they can sort of, just to even experiment with themselves before they go out and experiment doing something weird in the world. Um, is there any, I, I guess the question is, um, uh, for, for, well, you know, take a, a thing out of Roger Hallam's thing, you know, advice to, advice to young people as they face the world we live in, uh, if you want to experiment oh, with going a bit face weird. Face annihilation, you know, face annihilation. It, well, yeah, we'll face annihilation, yeah. 
I, I, I didn't. Uh, um, but if you, if you uh, personally, just my comment, just as a result of my, what I've done myself, is I think it's better just to uh, spend a bit of time being completely weird by yourself um, before you uh, move out and, and be weird outside. Um, you know, explore yourself first, uh, you know, get, get, a, get a, I don't know, get the hang of it. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. Um, <clears throat> um, but, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of that, you know, you said, you said, you know, don't go and be weird outside unless you've got a, a, a an alibi kind of thing. Um, but is there any, is there, I guess, is there anything that somebody can do if they don't have much private space in which to be weird just in their own little realm? Can you say anything about that that might be helpful? So it's, it's not bad that we live in the panopticon and there's, there is nothing, uh, there's no solo space where you can do solo exploration. That's not an entirely mm. bad thing. What it means is that you cannot do uh, solo psych psychonautical thing unless you, you really become quite adept at it. So, okay, number of things to say here is that <clears throat> because we're in the, uh, the panopticon, the reason why the Vogons, the reason why the cops, uh, all the, you know, the cop, I mean, the cop archetype, all this, the, the, the despots and the, the tyrannized, they watch the shamans because they want the shaman's magic. So part of the reason that they, you know, say J. Edgar Hoover or, you know, Pompeo or these guys in the CIA, they, they tell them <coughs> that they're preserving democracy, they're preserving our cult and our culture they keeping the, the the citizens safe it's 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 hokum what they're really trying to do is they want into the orgy and they're not invited they're not equipped basically nobody is gonna uh, invite yeah, Edgar yeah. to anything fun but he wants to know mm -hmm. he's obsessed right, with what's behind the green door knowing that he's never going to be invited behind the green door so there's a so now knowing that it means that it's not a bad thing that basically there's a 24-hour surveillance. What it means is J. Edgar Hoover and the cop archetype has to be invited to the party. You can't uh, have the party because they're going to they're raid it and wreck it. So think of the panopticon mm. more like you have to be a shaman and you have to do development for the collective, including the cop in, of the prison. You have to basically. So you just go back, go, go back. You you dropped out. You dropped out. You dropped. A, you dropped the so, sentence. Dropped out, and you, uh, I missed the meaning. You, Can you just say you, this a whole little bit? Just the sentence. You have to about do the shaman for, just before you. Said. You 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 have, as a shaman in the panopticon, you have to do this work for the collective, including the cop and the cop archetype. So including the prison wardens and the overlords, you you you. It's incumbent okay. on you. Yeah to take a full stage in the limelight and do their progression towards the Hyros Gamos. So, it, it, so they're going to scrutinize you. And, and what they want is your imagination. They want, they want your self-development. They, they want what they will never have, and that's your humanity. So, but you, you're going to have to get past them in full sight. So, okay, like, let me take it to an, a specific, which actually happened. The great Hang story on, just before you go ahead, I, yeah. I just want to check that I've understood that. You're, you're saying that what you should do, because we're living in the panopticon, is that you've got to be the, sh the shaman and you've got to include the cop in your... Your, um, your, uh, your progression, yeah, your progress... Your, your, your progress yeah, yeah. And enlightenment has to include the cop. Knowing the cop doesn't have the legs yeah. to get there, right? So, so, so mm. you you have to think of yourself as a patient uh, with, say, a doctor or psychiatrist monitoring you. Now, the, the, <coughs> the doctor is trapped, trapped in the prison. The psychiatrist is trapped in their mental asylum. 
they will die in that mental asylum. Just like Lady Alla, they do not have the capacity to escape the prison. They do not have the capacity. Psychiatrists don't have a, the capacity to escape their own psychi psychiatric institution. So, so yeah, but, yeah. but they're desperate for progress and enlightenment and, and some kind of growth. They use the patient to get that growth by proxy thinking that they can steal their way into heaven because of this, this person will get that. So they, they thinking in terms of a scapegoat, the patient is a scapegoat. The patient will lead them all the way into heaven. Then they can sacrifice the patient and leap over them to get to heaven is the kind of psychology data. Now you can go into a specific where this actually happened, where uh, in Nelson Mandela was, the great story about Nelson Mandela is the pilgrim's progress, his spiritual and psychological development. He went from being a bit bomb-planting, bomb you know, he wasn't sentenced to 32 years in, in jail because he, he, had, he didn't like apartheid. He did that because he was implicated in a bomb plot that killed civilians. He was evil. So he came from being an evil cunt to being Saint Mandela. Now, it's important that that's the way it's reported because everybody said reports it now rather conveniently is how Saint Mandela got sent to prison. No, an evil cunt was sent to prison and Saint Mandela came out. That's the story that needs to be told. And that's the story that we cannot tell ourselves because we're not allowed to progress physically. We're not allowed to progress out of our own prison. So they have to suppress what actually happened, the fact. Now, if you have a look at what Robin, uh, Robin Island, where they were, where were they were kept under maximum surveillance, in a panopticon, in effect, they progress all the way to sainthood. Every one of those guys in the ANC, they, they educated each other. They taught each other how to dance in secret, at quiet at night, where, where they put you know, blankets on their on their feet. So they could shuffle around without the guards hearing them. They were they were under such surveillance, but they they cultivated themselves and elevated themselves in full sight of the guards. They they were doing subver subversion in plain sight. They they were basically kaffirs who were basically supposed to rot in jail forever because they tried to because they tried to basically steal fire from the white people. Now, what they did was they stole fire from the white people by, by elevating themselves in situ right in front of the guards. They knew that the guards had to basically participate. They couldn't go up against the guards and say, we're going to read this, we're going to teach each other philosophy, we're going to discuss politics, and basically say, you know, and, and we're going to do it in defiance of the guards. The, the guards would have crushed them, bang, bang, bang them down. They had to do it as a game. Where, where, where every move they made also elevated the consciousness of the guards. When mm. basically Nelson Mandela reached sainthood, there was one of the jailers, in fact, maybe more than one, where he was firm friends with and stayed friends. Mm. So they his life. Mm. The reason was that they made spiritual progress together inside the gulag. So it was it, so. So the prisoners taught the guards, and the prisoners worked to elevate the humanity of the guards and the prisoners. And so that is yeah. the story of Mandela. It's a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. and it's lost because we're not allowed that dialogue. We're not allowed to know that's what happened. So, so, so because of. Because we live, you know, Robben Island is global. It's just a small corner yeah, yeah, of yeah, prison. Yeah. Mm. Nelson Mandela made it out of like cell block H to the presidency of just another big cell block. But no one has made it out of the prison planning. Anybody with yeah. an ounce of awareness like these guys in the ANC. They have to elevate everybody at the same time in plain sight. It's terribly dangerous. 
they have to it's basically it's it's messianic you have to take on the sins and burden of the prison and the gods and you have to do it in full view in this kind of an art so, so basically the patient has to assume the role of doctor to as knowing Phew. that the doctor cannot be saved knowing that the doctor is ir irredeemable they, they they are psychopaths you you at some stage you've got to put a knife in them they become the sacrificial goat so so they try the psychopaths are trying to trick us they're trying to let us lead them out of the forest where they assume then they will go us up and be free we have to lead them out of the forest and stab them in the night because they are not they are beings of the forest they are beings of the prison they must die in incarceration. That mindset and the prison mindset must die with the prison. You cannot let Can them I? Them. <laughs> you leave Sorry. them on so that they feel that they part. So basically, we're now in Auschwitz. You cannot escape Auschwitz by tunneling out alone. The SS will get you. The only way out of Auschwitz is to collectively involve the SS, involve the guards, and then let's say we all need to escape Auschwitz. They will say, yes, yes, we hate fucking this system, and let's fucking, how do we get out? You have to lead them mm. along knowing that at some stage you have to put the knife in just before the breakout. You've got to, you, you have to just know that SS guards cannot get out. They cannot know that they're not allowed out and they, because mm. they, they are not constituted for heaven. And so they, basically you, you have to just work with them, pretending that we all get out. And, and as some people in the know have to know that at the moment of the breakout, you need to stuff out the guys that, that, that let you out. In some ways, this was in, in the One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. One of the things that people miss yeah. out of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is that the guy, the main guy of the movie, is that Indian guy. The Indian guy that breaks out and gets free of that mental asylum, he is us. He is the main protagonist. Everybody thinks the Jack Nicholson guy is the main protagonist. No, he's the Christ figure. He's the messianic figure that is destined to die for the sins of the asylum so that the Indian guy can go free. The Indian guy is us. The Jack Nicholson guy is, is the, the sacrificial lamb. He's the Christ figure that gets crucified in order to free the uh, the Indian guy. Now remember, the Indian guy snuffs out the Jack Nicholson character because Jack Nicholson can never. Be Hang on, how here? Just just to go back, how does this tally with the prison guard, the the prison uh, warden that uh, became a friend of Mandela? Because that seems to be an exception to what you're saying. In the so they never wrong. got out. They're still in the prison in South Africa. You see what? what you see, what, what happened was the ANC got into power and then just became prison guards. So they, they, they became mm. capitalists. They were communists. They had grand ideals. No, no, no. I, I just mean the particular case, the particular case where Mandela or, or where, where the, the, those, when they were in Robben Island and, and they began to, the, the guards began to part of their, um, Awakening. Uh, so they were actually they they came along for the ride. Um, they didn't you need know, to. No, they thought more than that. They thought they were the central sense. figure. They thought that they were the central figures. So so in other words, mm. they Can gave I... them narcissistic supply. The, so so but it they were all the prisoners were always in charge, and they would reinforce that. They did it really straight from the left brain in full consciousness they knew that they had to let the the prison guards know that they were in charge they did it in all this slow subtle way for example when when yeah. say four guards would march them they would they would march the prisoners and then you know the the you'd have four guards and the prisoner was supposed to march like you know they tried to make it like the military now you you can you have a little bit of leeway to march yeah. slowly yeah. To march fast. They know what you're doing. They know that you know they know what they're doing. 
So you're playing this game in, in something like just marching from here to the warden's office. You, you know that if you refuse to go to the warden's office, you'll be dragged there and beaten. So you, you're just staying on this side of being beaten, on this side of being insecure. Yeah. And so you, you, but the fact that you are controlling it, you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm going insolent, I'm going insolent. You want to get out your truncheon and wallop me, yeah. but I, I came back and I'm a good boy again. And, and the, yeah, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the guys are like, ooh, ooh, you came close, Mandela. I almost got off my knockery and walloped you. You say you, you play a dangerous game. But you see, as they're playing the game, it's reinforcing that they're playing to the Piper's tune and Mandela is the Piper. And that in yeah. long thing, I, that's the long road to subordinating the prison guards. Yeah. So, yeah. so but now, it never worked. The, Mandela and the prison guards never got out of prison. They still locked in prison, in the prison, you know, buried in the prison graveyard. Can I, uh, I just wanted to ask something. Um, yeah, uh, just going back, uh, we might have to finish with this here because we've been going for three hours. So, so just, um, if it's okay, we with you, well, just just one thing that came to mind is uh, uh, in one of the meetings a little while ago, you were talking about the traditional peoples. Uh, if they identified uh, uh, somebody in the tribe who was going to grow up to be psychopathic, they would take them away and just sort of quietly do away with them. And um, also shamanic. You know, and you were saying they, shamanic they would encourage them. So the, both, right? Yeah. The thing is, um, uh, there was a contradiction. Just let me gather what I'm trying to say here. Um, they, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. Um, that they... Uh, well, for a start... It, uh, what stopped them from going down a slippery slope of eugenics? In other words, if they would, if they identified some child in the tribe <clears throat> and thought, "Uh oh, this one's going to grow up to be troublesome. We better do away with it before it gets gets out of control," and so they just uh, quietly, t you know, go off, as you said, and somebody draws a straw and they get the job of of uh, getting rid of the, of the problem. Um, but. Um, was there any tendency for them then to get on to the next little aberration and start doing away with other people in, in the tribe? You know, that they were bumping uh, off the obvious cases, which no, did no. they ever... Did... So, so they are eugenicists. Without a doubt, they're being eugenicists. But the yeah, thing that's is, what I thought. their motives are quite different. You see, one thing, it, yeah. it's done with regret. And, and so it, okay. it's, it's done as a healing. So they kind of, you know, doing it with great regrets, like cutting off a limb, okay. it's gangrenous or has cancer. Mm -hmm. So they, mm -hmm. they cutting out a cancer with great regret and sadness. Yeah. Now, the yeah. eugenicists have no feeling. They're basically, they just uh, farmers that are breeding cattle. So the eugenicists yeah. feel that they're in control. The cattle are subordinate. Those guys never mm. thought that they subordinate, right? They never thought that the, the, the psychopath was subordinate. In fact, the opposite, that it was a huge, overwhelming evil spirit. It was much greater than them. So, mm. so you know, the awe and reverence that they have for this demonic force. It's complete opposite where eugenics, th think of it as decay coming from the bottom up. Yeah. Um, they didn't see it that way. No, they, they, they saw this, this evil that, that were, was, had potential to overwhelm the whole, the whole village. So it, it's, it's quite a religious thing. It's not um, perfunctory and this kind of heartless, um, you know, breeding narrative where you castrate the bullocks and milk the cows. Yeah. Um, and I guess the final thing related to that, I just remembered, what it was, was when you were talking about the uh, baboon tribe where the, the garbage dump baboons, you know, where the uh, the violent, the, the dominant males all died off and um, 
then after that, the uh, the, the the troop became um, more of a cooperative, um, perhaps a matriarchal um, thing that, that didn't display this this uh, um, uh, male dominated sort of violent group. Um, and what I was, I mean, I realise on the one hand we're dealing with baboons and on the other hand we're dealing with humans, but you said that, um, and, and I read it too at the time, I remember ages ago when you first uh, yeah, referred to the article, or the, whatever it was, I can't remember the details, but um, that then uh, new males would come into this now matriarchal baboon troop and uh, and they would find that their their uh, tough guy tactics didn't get them anywhere, and so they would they would drop that. So these young males would come in, and they would drop that, and they would become uh, sort of uh, assimilated into the uh, into the, um, the, the the matriarchal group, um, and so it, it the group remained like that. It didn't revert back to a. a, 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 a um, you know the male dominated um, uh, violent kind of thing that it was before and what I was uh, thinking about there was that <clears throat> uh, because consistently we talked about the human psychopaths as being irredeemable and I was just wondering because in the in the parallel situation of the baboon troop the the uh, what psychopathic young males are coming into the group and yet they are being redeemed they're being changed and dropping that um and yet you've got these tribal situations where as you said you know maybe by the time a child is four years old and they've identified that it's going to be a problem they take it out and, and quietly get rid of it there didn't seem to be an option to question could you change that child so that it didn't grow up like that so can you just talk about that why why the child is not redeemable and well, the baboon was it's it's nature and nurture so uh the the baboons the the male baboons that were integrated into the chill hippie troop uh, that's a cultural thing so they, they resorted to violence to get what they wanted because of they were instructed and trained in a culture of violence that the way you get something is violence. So, so you know, if you go into any corporation in America now, you will see all these middle managers and, and uh, executives and backstabbing their way to the top. They're not psychopaths. They, mm. They've been. They know from the culture that to, n nice guys finish last, and you you know you've got to do some backstabbing to get ahead. Oh, they don't awesome. like it. It's not innate in them. Right. right. The, those yeah, four year olds yeah, are yeah. cruel. They, yeah, they're innately yeah. cruel, and it's genetic. So yeah. they they what they doing is getting pleasure out of another animal's pain. Now, you know, even the mm. even the worst executives that I've seen is is like. A lot of them are genetic psychopaths. Increasing number of them are genetic psychopaths, and you can see them taking pleasure out of other people's pain. But but the you know still the vast majority of people in our culture are, are just acculturated to uh, dominance and violence, and it's that will shed it. No, nobody really wants it. I mean, if, if you have a church fate or you. You you know put them on an island where so the, is is this uh, this is what you would call secondary psychopathy? Yeah, those psychopaths they can't party right. The the psychopaths mm. can't party, so they they can't ever let go. They can't ever party. They've got to be in control. They're cruel. They have to be the center, and it's basically yeah. it's genetic. You 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 can't. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I can I uh, um. Sorry, you dropped right out here. I'll just wait for a moment. Oh, yeah, you did too. Okay, so start again. You, it's you. Uh, yeah, what I was just going to ask is, uh, so what you're saying is that a lot of those people caught up in the corporate environment, that's what you would call s secondary psychopathy. In other words, they're, they're not innately like that. They're, they're taking that on as a result of their circumstance. Um, and, and so yeah, they it's, could it's be culture. brought. 
It's a prison for yeah. Animals. So they could that, they they so could they could be them. redeemed. Yeah. Now, yeah, well, um, well, no, so yeah, as so soon that, as you take them out of the prison, they will stop behaving like prisoners. So, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes, they could be redeemed. But, um, okay, so the final point on this is, I guess, um, is um, you get variation in human beings. Like you, you, you get people born who are, uh, well, I, I suppose the obvious example is, is, is homosexuality. Um, and uh, I don't know, I just can't think of another example. Um, was there or is there any, any uh, circumstance in which a psychopathy arising in, in a person who was born um, is was of any use. I mean, it, it obviously it keeps arising. People, it, it, you know, a certain number of people are born like that. And, and as you said, you know, they, that you can't change them. Uh, you know, maybe you could just draw that parallel with, with somebody who was homosexual. And of course, we've long since established that, you know, you aren't, you, you can, this is not something that, that can be sort of, you know, cured, so to speak, or altered in people. So with, with the, this continued re-arising of, 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 of a certain percentage of psychopaths, um, did it ever serve any purpose? Is it something that's got out of control or, or did it, did it, would it ever have had something going for it in, term, in terms of it? Uh, yeah, so it, it's divisive and it splits. The danger of it, it'll, it'll split the tribe. So mm. it, it's, it, it comes committant with the alien cortex. So it's useful in battle. So if you have some guy like Patton or something like that, he's very mm. useful when you go to war against somebody like Hitler. But if you don't have mm. Hitlers and Patton's, you don't need them. They're useless. They're superfluous. So, so if you if one person goes psychotic in the in the psychopathic way, you need psychopaths to counter them. So it's basically there are only two counters, and it's psychopaths and shamans. Shamans don't martial armies often, and basically put people in a hierarchy so they can beat a bigger hierarchy. But if if a hierarchy forms, then you need to form one pronto to counter it, and then you need a psychopath at the at the you know tip of the spear. So it when things go wrong, so it's it's kind of like you know if you wind up in a prison yard, yeah, your faction in the prison yard better have a big guy, to, <laughs> a big evil Manson to look after it. It's like yeah, Manson's really useful in the prison yard, but like. You say, like, where did the prison yard come from? Because of the Manson. So it's always a, a. Uh... Yeah, I'm just. Well, I guess the point I'm trying to get to is that that it it's it's you know if these people are being born like this, then this is a legitimately a a a a, a defect a. It's yeah, okay. we, we, we're paying a price for our, our brain. So it's basically for the, the, the oh, okay. yeah, as our brain you. develops, we, we're, paying yeah. a lot of, we're yeah. paying a lot of price. One of them is we pay a price yeah. in childbirth because we have such a huge head. Right. Um, but mm. We're puny yeah. and we can't run very fast and our best uh, defense yeah. is yeah. communal activity. So we can, yeah. we can you know, kind of like awkward apes that we are, we can basically fend off a lion attack because we can work together and we're smart as fuck. But, the, yes. but uh, that comes at a huge price for, you know, our huge head has got to squeeze through the birth canal of these narrow, you know, hips uh, that we need. For yeah. The yeah. Yeah. And so there, there, there are all these compromises. So one of the, right. the things of being that smart and being a social animal <laughs> Means that some people are going to be too are, too are going to be born like that. They're going to be off the spectrum. Yeah, and so, yeah. They're, no, they'll be, the, yeah, they'll be smart yeah. enough to to work against the cohesion of the tribe and instead of you know uh, work for it. So no, yeah. no, thanks. I appreciate that. That was the missing thing that I hadn't hadn't been able to think my way to that point. Yeah, yeah. That that was that's answered that very well. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, look, I think we should possibly. Finish there. Uh, um, can, can I just say one yeah. more thing about sure, sure. Uh, you know the budget, the crazy budget. 
So yeah. I mentioned one thing about, okay, just basically doing, <clears throat> doing therapy for the doctor and the patient. The burden of doing the therapy for both of them is on the patient. Now, okay, that's when it's done in the limelight in the middle of the panopticon. As an individual, you cannot, if, if you have any freedom at all, you need to find some solo development time if you can. The reason is, if you look at, say, the tantric tradition and things like that, part of tantra is to do forbidden stuff. So the left-handed left -handed tantric um, practices were like mada mudra and all this. Basically, they were things like, you know, licking menstrual blood and killing somebody, mm. murder, mm. all these committing these taboos. What the point of these taboos is, is kind of like um, kind of an Al Alistair Crowley thing, where they're getting yeah. elevated consciousness by doing these th forbidden things. If you do uh, such a forbidden act, the, it's, it's hyper arousal. And so they're wiring up a lot of their brains that the average domesticated lamb cannot wire up in their flock. Mm. If you mm. go outside your flock and you do some something like, for example, in Tantra, something extreme. guys would go and meditate on a corpse. So they basically they would they would sit mm. on the okay. chest of a corpse in a graveyard in a cemetery, which is kind of easy to do in India because you get you know if they didn't quite finish the crematorium, if the guy didn't have enough money to buy wood, then basically his half charred body would be left bodies. In the area. Yeah. And so yeah. Any Tantra guru or oh, Adapt uh, any tantrico practitioner. Along, yeah. This corpse, yeah, this corpse there, and wait for all the mourners to fuck off, and they're in the moonlight. Mm. You go and sit on mm. this corpse's chest and and, mm. and meditate. You say, well, why? And you say, well, because it's just creepy as fuck. And basically, <laughs> what it, it's a memento mori. So what they're doing is they're putting themselves very close to death. I mean, and by sitting on it, basically. By sitting on a corpse, it's, you, you've, got to, you've got to, even if you never saw a Hollywood movie, you've got to assume that the guy might, you know, leap up and grab you or something. <laughs> there might be a few pop-ups and stuff. It's, it's very, very um, arousing. Now, if you do that, if you go and meditate in a, in a cemetery, um, it's very useful because you're getting, you're exploring these out of you know, these states of mind that, that are. You won't I, believe me, will you? You won't believe well, me if I tell you I've done it. <laughs> so have I, but you Sorry. don't go there. Yes. There's not, there's not this very PG video. <laughs> but for the children, we, we say as an example yeah. is that you, you have to, you can't just stay in the panorama. If you have the opportunity to go out and this, look, the first thing you're going to find out is, is that you're not the hero you think you are. You, you think, mm -hmm. you know, all these people start out and they think they're the first person that ever had a spiritual journey and they're basically, they, they breaking ground and soon they're going to be writing books like Alistair Crowley and they, going to be psychonauts that, you know, be Neil Armstrong version of a psychonaut and stuff. Horseshit. The first thing you'll do is when you go out at night, let's take that one. Just say you go and try this. If, you, if you're in England, it's great. You've got, I'm sure you've got a church. You've got a cemetery. You can easily sneak into that cemetery, sit on a gravestone in the full moon, and meditate. Okay, A, the chances that the cops come and arrest you are high, so you've got to do it like a military operation. All yeah. of it heightens the whole thing. You're going to be scared mm -hmm. out of your wits by every owl and every mouse that's there, and that's good too because you'll be hyper aroused. So, basically, but the other thing you're going to find out is there's an underground of people doing this shit, and you will meet them. They all, there's an underculture that, you know, liberals don't know about that basically all these homeless people and janitors and, and things. There's an, un, you see, beneath the rafters, beneath the floorboards of our sick liberal culture of democracy, 
is this subversive underground culture. It's, it, I mean, it's like almost Dickensian that you can you can fall out of the parlor into this world you never knew, this underworld. Mm. It's, it's, it's a trope mm. in all these movies, in this dystopian movies, that everybody falls down the well to the sewer people. Well, if you do that, yeah. you know, about the sewer people. The sewer people have a lot to teach you. The sewer, yeah. you, you will find yeah. that there's that you know all these liberals that are in Extinction Rebellion saying, you know, oh, but we can never overthrow this culture. Well, no, you can't because you're a fucking liberal normie conformist. There's an army of sewer people that are just ready to crawl out of the sewers and take over this whole fucking cesspit of a culture we have. Now, liberals don't know that because the BBC doesn't report that shit and neither does CNN. They don't know because they went to college and they sit talking corporate shit out of a corporate studio. They don't know that this army of, of undesirables and is, is lurking under yeah. the surface. And you will meet yeah. them They're all out there. They're all out there doing psychonautical stuff. They're all out there doing subversion. And basically, and you need to get a strong yeah. stomach and meet those people and talk to them and make friends with yeah. them. And you will yeah. find really ma scary shit you you will find demons and gods and you you will find apparitions get used to it uh, uh, yeah yeah it, it's you start stretching your legs and navigating these 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 territories and do it properly you you want to be a jekyll and hyde have a double life be squeaky clean mm. on the outside build build yeah. up your corners as as a nice normal human being and then go underground and go and f fraternize with this underworld and underworld culture, but but yeah, um, be be very sure that nobody knows you're leading a double life. One of the amazing things you'll find is all the elites are there, all the fucking elites, and they're you know every now and again the bit of bit of scum surfaces like the Epstein thing. But like, you know, all the elites are doing this. All the elites are they're not only going and and elevating their consciousness by going to the opera, they're also going and doing this devious stuff. And they're all these kids um around the place. Uh the kids uh, you know, there's an underculture of kids doing basically going to haunted buildings and doing kind of Blair Witch stuff. And it, it there, there's a whole world out there. Uh, the, before we even get onto the dark web, where, where all these nice little liberals um, never go. And you need to start venturing forth into those areas to elevate your consciousness. Okay, are you, are you there still, Gary? Because I've uh, lost you. Are you there? Oh, well, okay, well, I guess that um, that ends the recording. So, okay, uh, did you get back on? Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't know what happened. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, Look, anyway, maybe you're, we should... We, you you, we'll you have there, to watch the recording for, <laughs> for what I said at the end. Uh, yeah, anyway. I, missed, I missed at least a couple of sentences, yeah. Look, um, thanks for that, Hugh. That, that was really great. Um, yeah. So, look, I, I really have to end there anyway because my back is just yeah. so sore from sitting here. I, I've got to move. Okay. You know? um, but, yeah, oh, that was great. That was wonderful. Long yeah. format? Just, long uh, format. Yeah, just before you go, I'll just check quickly my email and see if we got anything from Roger. Um, okay, today. I'll stop recording, okay?